Book three, part three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book three, part three. And also that good and bad rhythm naturally assimilate to a good and bad style, and that harmony and discord in like manner follow style. For our principle is that rhythm and harmony are regulated by the words, and not the words by them. Just so, he said, they should follow the words. And will not the words and the character of the style depend on the temper of the soul? Yes. And everything else on the style? Yes. The beauty of style and harmony and grace and good rhythm depend on simplicity. I mean the true simplicity of a rightly and nobly ordered mind and character. Not that other simplicity which is only a euphemism for folly. Very true, he replied. And if our youth are to do their work in life, must they not make these graces and harmonies their perpetual aim? They must. And surely the art of the painter and every other creative and constructive art are full of them, weaving, embroidery, architecture, and every kind of manufacture, also nature, animal and vegetable. In all of them there is grace, or the absence of grace. And ugliness and discord and inharmonious motion are nearly allied to ill words and ill nature, as grace and harmony are the twin sisters of goodness and virtue and bear their likeness. That is quite true, he said. But shall our superintendents go no further, and are the poets only to be required by us to express the image of the good in their works, on pain, if they do anything else, of expulsion from our state? Or is the same control to be extended to other artists, and are they also to be prohibited from exhibiting the opposite forms of vice and intemperance and meanness and indecency in sculpture and building and the other creative arts? And is he who cannot conform to this rule of ours to be prevented from practicing his art in our state, lest the taste of our citizens be corrupted by him? We would not have our guardians grow up amid images of moral deformity, as in some noxious pasture, and their brows and feed upon many a baneful herb and flower day by day, little by little, until they silently gather a festering mass of corruption in their own soul. Let our artists rather be those who are gifted to discern the true nature of the beautiful and graceful. Then will our youth dwell in a land of health, amid fair sights and sounds, and receive the good in everything, and beauty, the effluence of fair works, shall flow into the eye and ear like a health-giving breeze from a purer region and insensibly draw the soul from earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason. There can be no nobler training than that, he replied. And therefore, I said, Glaucon, musical training is a more potent instrument than any other, because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul, on which they mightily fasten, imparting grace, and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful, or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature, and with a true taste, while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good, and becomes noble and good, he will justly blame and hate the bad, now in the days of his youth, even before he is able to know the reason why, and when reason comes he will recognize and salute the friend with whom his education has made him long familiar. Yes, he said, I quite agree with you in thinking that our youth should be trained in music and on the grounds which you mention. Just as in learning to read, I said, we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet, which are very few, in all their recurring sizes and combinations, not sliding them as unimportant whether they occupy a space large or small, but everywhere either to make them out, and not thinking ourselves perfect in the art of reading until we recognize them wherever they are found. True. Or, as we recognize the reflection of letters in the water, or in a mirror, only when we know the letters themselves, the same art and study giving us the knowledge of both. Exactly. Even so, as I maintain, neither we, nor our guardians, whom we have to educate, can ever become musical until we and they know the essential forms of temperance, courage, liberality, magnificence, and their kindred, as well as the contrary forms in all their combinations and can recognize them in their images whenever they are found, not slighting them either in small things or great, but believing them all to be within the sphere of one art and study. Most assuredly. And when a beautiful soul harmonizes with a beautiful form, and the two are cast in one mold, 
that will be the fairest of sights to him who has an eye to see it? The fairest, indeed. And the fairest is also the loveliest? That may be assumed. And the man who has the spirit of harmony will be most in love with the loveliest, but he will not love him who is of an inharmonious soul? That is true, he replied, if the deficiency be in his soul. But if there be any merely bodily defect in another, he will be patient of it, and will love all the same. I perceive, I said, that you have or have had experiences of this sort, and I agree. But let me ask you another question. Has excess of pleasure any affinity to temperance? How can that be, he replied? Pleasure deprives a man of the use of his faculties quite as much as pain. Or any affinity to virtue in general? None whatever. Any affinity to wantonness and intemperance? Yes, the greatest. And is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love? No, nor a matter. Whereas true love is a love of beauty and order, temperate and harmonious? Quite true, he said. Then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love? Certainly not. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort? No, indeed, Socrates, it must never come near them. Then I suppose that in the city which we are founding you would make a law to the effect that a friend should use no other familiarity to his love than a father would use to his son, and then only for a noble purpose, and he must first have the other's consent, and this rule is to limit him in all his intercourse, and he is never to be seen going further, or, if he exceeds, he is to be deemed guilty of coarseness and bad taste. I quite agree, he said. This much of music, which makes a fair ending. For what should be the end of music, if not the love of beauty? I agree, he said. After music comes gymnastic, in which our youth are next to be trained. Certainly. Gymnastic as well as music should begin in early years. The training in it should be careful and should continue throughout life. Now my belief is and this is a matter upon which I should like to have your opinion in confirmation of my own. But my belief is, not that the good body by any bodily excellence improves the soul, but, on the contrary, that the good soul, by her own excellence, improves the body as far as this may be possible. What do you say? Yes, I agree. Then to the mind, when adequately trained, we should be right in handing over the more particular care of the body. And in order to avoid prolixity, we may now only give the general outlines of the subject. Very good. That they must abstain from intoxication has been already remarked by us. For of all persons a guardian should be the last to get drunk and not know where in the world he is. Yes, he said, that a guardian should require another guardian to take care of him is ridiculous indeed. But next, what shall we say of their food? For the men are in training for the greatest contest of all, are they not? Yes, he said. And will the habit of body of our ordinary athletes be suited to them? Why not? I am afraid, I said, that the habit of body such as they have is but a sleepy sort of thing, and rather perilous to health. Do you not observe that these athletes sleep away their lives, and are liable to most dangerous illnesses if they depart, in ever so slight a degree, from their customary regimen? Yes, I do. Then, I said, a finer sort of training will be required for our warrior athletes, who are to be like wakeful dogs, and to see and hear with the utmost keenness amid the many changes of water and also of food, of summer heat and winter cold, which they will have to endure when on a campaign, they must not be liable to break down in health. That is my view. The really excellent gymnastic is twin sister of that simple music which we were just now describing. How so? Why, I conceive that there is a gymnastic which, like our music, is simple and good, and especially the military gymnastic. What do you mean? My meaning may be learned from Homer. He, you know, feeds his heroes at their feasts, when they are campaigning on soldiers' fare. They have no fish, although they are on the shores of the Hellespont, and they are not allowed boiled meats but only roast, which is the food most convenient for soldiers, requiring only that they should light a fire, and not involving the trouble of carrying about pots and pans. True. And I can hardly be mistaken in saying that sweet sauces are nowhere mentioned in Homer. In proscribing them, however, he is not singular. All professional athletes are well aware that a man who is to be in good condition should take nothing of the kind. Yes, he said, and knowing this, they are quite right in not taking them. 
then would you not approve of Syracusan dinners, and the refinement of Sicilian cookery? I think not. Nor, if a man is to be in condition, would you allow him to have a Corinthian girl as his fair friend? Certainly not. Neither would you approve the delicacies, as they are thought, of Athenian confectionery? Certainly not. All such feeding and living may be rightly compared by us to melody and song composed in the panharmonic style, and in all the rhythms. Exactly. Their complexity engendered license, and here disease, whereas simplicity in music was the parent of temperance in the soul, and simplicity in gymnastic of health in the body. Most true, he said. But when intemperance and diseases multiply in a state, halls of justice and medicine are always being opened, and the arts of the doctor and the lawyer give themselves airs, finding how keen is the interest which not only the slaves but the freemen of a city take about them. Of course. And yet what greater proof can there be of a bad and disgraceful state of education than this, that not only artisans and the meaner sort of people need the skill of first-rate physicians and judges, but also those who would profess to have had a liberal education? Is it not disgraceful, and a great sign of want of good breeding, that a man should have to go abroad for his law and physic because he has none of his own at home, and must therefore surrender himself into the hands of other men whom he makes lords and judges over him? Of all things, he said, the most disgraceful. Would you say most, I replied, when you consider that there is a further stage of evil in which a man is not only a lifelong litigant, passing all his days in the courts, either as plaintiff or defendant, but is actually led by his bad taste to pride himself on his litigiousness. He imagines that he is a master in dishonesty, able to take every crooked turn, and wriggle into and out of every hole, bending like a withy and getting out of the way of justice. And all for what? In order to gain small points not worth mentioning. He not knowing that so to order his life as to be able to do without a napping judge is a far higher and nobler sort of thing. Is that not still more disgraceful? Yes, he said. That is still more disgraceful. Well, I said, and to require the help of medicine, not when a wound has to be cured, or on occasion of an epidemic, but just because, by indolence and a habit of life such as we have been describing, Men fill themselves with waters and winds, as if their bodies were a marsh, compelling the ingenious sons of Asclepius to find more names for diseases, such as flatulence and catarrh. Is this not, too, a disgrace? Yes, he said, they do certainly give very strange and newfangled names to diseases. Yes, I said, and I do not believe that there were any such diseases in the days of Asclepius, and this I infer from the circumstance that the hero Eurypylus, after he had been wounded in Homer, drinks a posset of premium wine well besprinkled with parley meal and grated cheese, which are certainly inflammatory. And yet the sons of Asclepius who were at the Trojan War do not blame the damsel who gives him the drink, or rebuke Patroclus, who is treating his case. Well, he said, that was surely an extraordinary drink to be given to a person in his condition. Not so extraordinary, I replied, if you bear in mind that in former days, as is commonly said, before the time of Herodicus, the guild of Asclepius did not practice our present system of medicine, which may be said to educate diseases. But Herodicus, being a trainer, and himself of a sickly constitution, by a combination of training and doctoring found out a way of torturing, first and chiefly himself, and secondly the rest of the world. How was that, he said? By the invention of lingering death, for he had a mortal disease which he perpetually tended, and as recovery was out of the question, he passed his entire life as a valetudinarian. He could do nothing but attend upon himself, and he was in constant torment whenever he departed in anything from his usual regimen. And so dying hard, by the help of science he struggled on to old age. A rare reward of his skill. Yes, I said, a reward which a man might fairly expect who never understood that. If Asclepius did not instruct his descendants in valetudinarian arts, the omission arose, not from ignorance or inexperience of such a branch of medicine, but because he knew that in all well-ordered states every individual has an occupation to which he must attend, and has therefore no leisure to spend in continually being ill. This we remark in the case of the artisan, but, ludicrously enough, do not apply the same rule to people of the richer sort. How do you mean? he said. I mean this. When a carpenter is ill, he asks the physician for a rough and ready cure, an emetic, or a purge, or a cautery, or the knife. These are his remedies. And if someone prescribes for him a course of dietetics, 
and tells him that he must swathe and swaddle his head, and all that sort of thing. He replies at once that he has no time to be ill, and that he sees no good in a life which is spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his customary employment. And therefore bidding good-bye to this sort of physician, he resumes his ordinary habits, and either gets well and lives and does his business, or, if his constitution fails, he dies and has no more trouble. Yes, he said, a man in his condition of life ought to use the art of medicine thus far only. Has he not, I said, an occupation? And what profit would be there in his life if he were deprived of this occupation? Quite true, he said. But with the rich man this is otherwise. Of him we do not say that he has any specially appointed work which he must perform, if he would live. He is generally supposed to have nothing to do. Then you never heard of the saying of facilities, that as soon as a man has a livelihood he should practice virtue? Nay, he said, I think that he had better begin somewhat sooner. Let us not have a dispute about this, I said, but rather ask ourselves, is the practice of virtue obligatory on a rich man, or can he live without it? And if obligatory on him, then let us raise a further question, whether this dieting of disorders, which is an impediment to the application of the mind in carpentering and the mechanical arts, does not equally stand in the way of the sentiment of facilities? Of that, he replied, there can be no doubt. Such excessive care of the body, when carried beyond the rules of gymnastic, is most inimical to the practice of virtue. Yes, indeed, I replied, and equally incompatible with the management of a house, an army, or an office of state, and, what is most important of all, irreconcilable with any kind of study or thought or self-reflection. There is a constant suspicion that headache and giddiness are to be ascribed to philosophy, and hence all practicing or making trial of virtue in the higher sense is absolutely stopped, for a man is always fancying that he is being made ill, and is in constant anxiety about the state of his body. Yes, likely enough. And therefore our politic Asclepius may be supposed to have exhibited the power of his art only to persons who, being generally of healthy constitution and habits of life, had a definite ailment. Such as these he cured by purges and operations, and bade them live as usual, herein consulting the interest of the state. But bodies which diseases had penetrated through and through he would not have attempted to cure by gradual process of evacuation and infusion. He did not want to lengthen out good-for-nothing lives, or have weak fathers begetting weaker sons. If a man was not able to live in the ordinary way, he had no business to cure him. For such a cure would have been of no use either to himself or to the state. Then, he said, you regard Asclepius as a statesman. Clearly, and his character is further illustrated by his sons. Note that they were heroes in the days of old, and practiced the medicines of which I am speaking at the siege of Troy. You will remember how... When Pandarus wounded Menelaus, they sucked the blood out of the wound and sprinkled soothing remedies. But they never prescribed what the patient was afterwards to eat or drink in the case of Menelaus, any more than in the case of Eurypylus. The remedies, as they conceived, were enough to heal any man who, before he was wounded, was healthy and regular in his habits. And even though he did happen to drink a positive premium wine, he might get well all the same but they would have nothing to do with unhealthy and intemperate subjects, whose lives were of no use either to themselves or others. The art of medicine was not designed for their good, and though they were as rich as Midas, the sons of Asclepius would have declined to attend them. They were very acute persons, these sons of Asclepius. Naturally so, I replied. Nevertheless, the tragedians and Pindar, disobeying our behests, although they acknowledged that Asclepius was the son of Apollo, say also that he was bribed into healing a rich man who was at the point of death, and for this reason he was struck by lightning. But we, in accordance with the principle already affirmed by us, will not believe them when they tell us both. If he was the son of a god, we maintain that he was not avaricious, or, if he was avaricious, he was not the son of a god. End of Book 3, Part 3 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book 3, Part 4, Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Allman. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 3, Part 4. All that, Socrates, is excellent. But I should like to put a question to you. Ought there not to be good physicians in a state? and are not the best those who have treated the greatest number of constitutions, good and bad? 
and are not the best judges in like manner those who are acquainted with all sorts of moral natures? Yes, I said, I too would have good judges and good physicians. But do you know whom I think good? Will you tell me? I will if I can. Let me, however, note that in the same question you join two things which are not the same. How so? he asked. Why, I said, you join physicians and judges. Now the most skillful physicians are those who, from their youth upwards, have combined with the knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. They had better not be robust in health, and should have had all manner of diseases in their own persons. For the body, as I conceive, is not the instrument with which they cure the body. In that case we could not allow them ever to be or to have been sickly. But they cure the body with the mind, and the mind which has become and is sick can cure nothing. That is very true, he said. But with the judge it is otherwise. Since he governs mind by mind, he ought not, therefore, to have been trained among vicious minds, and to have associated with them from youth upwards, and to have gone through the whole calendar of crime, only in order that he may quickly infer the crimes of others as he might their bodily diseases from his own self-consciousness. The honorable mind which is to form a healthy judgment should have had no experience or contamination of evil habits while young. And this is the reason why, in youth, good men often appear to be simple, and are easily practiced upon by the dishonest, because they have no examples of what evil is in their own souls. Yes, he said, they are far too apt to be deceived. Therefore, I said, the judge should not be young. He should have learned to know evil, not from his own soul, but from late and long observation of the nature of evil in others. Knowledge should be his guide, not personal experience. Yes, he said, that is the ideal of a judge. Yes, I replied, and he will be a good man, which is my answer to your question. For he is good who has a good soul, but the cunning and suspicious nature of which we spoke, he who has committed many crimes and fancies himself to be a master in wickedness, when he is amongst his fellows, is wonderful in the precautions which he takes, because he judges of them by himself. But when he gets into the company of men of virtue, who have the experience of age, he appears to be a fool again, owing to his unseasonable suspicions. He cannot recognize an honest man, because he has no pattern of honesty in himself. At the same time, as the bad are more numerous than the good, and he meets with them oftener, he thinks himself, and is by others thought to be, rather wise than foolish. Most true, he said. Then the good and wise judge whom we are seeking is not this man, but the other. For vice cannot know virtue too, but a virtuous nature, educated by time, will acquire a knowledge both of virtue and vice. The virtuous, and not the vicious, man has wisdom, in my opinion, and in mine also. This is the sort of medicine, and this is the sort of law which you will sanction in your state. They will minister to better natures, giving health of both soul and of body. But those who are diseased in their bodies they will leave to die, and the corrupt and incurable souls they will put an end to themselves. This is clearly the best thing both for the patients and for the state. And thus our youth, having been educated only in that simple music which, as we said, inspires temperance, will be reluctant to go to law. Clearly. And the musician, who, keeping to the same track, is content to practice the simple gymnastic, will have nothing to do with medicine unless in some extreme case. That I quite believe. The very exercises and tolls which he undergoes are intended to stimulate the spirited element of his nature, and not to increase his strength. He will not, like common athletes, use exercise and regimen to develop his muscles. Very right, he said. Neither are the two arts of music and gymnastic really designed, as is often supposed, the one for the training of the soul, the other for the training of the body. What then is the real object of them? I believe, I said, that the teachers of both have in view chiefly the improvement of the soul. How can that be? he asked. Did you never observe, I said, the effect on the mind itself of exclusive devotion to gymnastic, or the opposite effect of an exclusive devotion to music? In what way shown, he said, the one producing a temper of hardness and ferocity, the other of softness and effeminacy, I replied. Yes, he said, I am quite aware that the mere athlete becomes too much of a savage, and that the mere musician is melted and softened beyond what is good for him. Yet surely, I said, this ferocity only comes from spirit, which, 
if rightly educated, would give courage, but, if too much intensified, is liable to become hard and brutal. That I quite think. On the other hand, the philosopher will have the quality of gentleness, and this also, when too much indulged, will turn to softness, but, if educated rightly, will be gentle and moderate. True. And in our opinion the guardians ought to have both these qualities? Assuredly. And both should be in harmony? Beyond question. And the harmonious soul is both temperate and courageous? Yes. And the inharmonious is cowardly and boorish? Very true. And when a man allows music to play upon him and to pour into his soul through the funnel of his ears those sweet and soft and melancholy airs of which we were just now speaking, and his whole life is passed in warbling and the delights of song. In the first stage of the process, the passion or spirit which is in him is tempered like iron, and made useful instead of brittle and useless. But, if he carries on the softening and soothing process, in the next stage he begins to melt and waste, until he has wasted away his spirit and cut out the sinews of his soul, and he becomes a feeble warrior. Very true. If the element of spirit is naturally weak in him, the change is speedily accomplished. But if he have a good deal, then the power of music weakening the spirit renders him excitable. On the least provocation he flames up at once, and is speedily extinguished. Instead of having spirit, he grows irritable and passionate, and is quite impractical. Exactly. And so in gymnastics, if a man takes violent exercise and is a great feeder, and the reverse of a great student of music and philosophy, at first the high condition of his body fills him with pride and spirit, and he becomes twice the man that he was. Certainly. And what happens? If he do nothing else, and holds no converse with the muses, does not even that intelligence which there may be in him, having no taste of any sort of learning or inquiry or thought or culture, grow feeble and dull and blind, his mind never waking up or receiving nourishment, and his senses not being purged of their mists? True, he said, and he ends by being a hater of philosophy, uncivilized, never using the weapon of persuasion. He is like a wild beast, all violence and fierceness, and knows no other way of dealing, and he lives in all ignorance and evil conditions, and has no sense of propriety and grace. That is quite true, he said. And as there are two principles of human nature, one the spirited and the other the philosophical, some god, as I should say, has given mankind two arts answering to them, and only indirectly to the soul and body, in order that these two principles, like the strings of an instrument, may be relaxed or drawn tighter until they are duly harmonized. And that appears to be the intention. And he who mingles music with gymnastic in the fairest proportion, and best attempers them to the soul, may be rightly called the true musician and harmonist in a far higher sense than the tuner of strings. You are quite right, Socrates, and such a presiding genius will always be required in our state if the government is to last. Yes, he will be absolutely necessary. Such, then, are our principles of nurture and education. Where would be the use of going into further details about the dances of our citizens, or about their hunting and coursing, their gymnastic and equestrian contests? For these all follow the general principle, and having found that, we shall have no difficulty in discovering them. I dare say that there will be no difficulty. Very good, I said. Then what is the next question? Must we not ask who are to be rulers and whose subjects? Certainly. There can be no doubt that the elder must rule the younger, clearly, and that the best of these must rule. That is also clear. Now are not the best husbandmen those who are most devoted to husbandry? Yes. And as we are to have the best guardians for our city, must they not be those who have most the character of guardians? Yes. And to this end they ought to be wise and efficient, and to have a special care of the state? True. And a man will be most likely to care about that which he loves? To be sure. And he will be most likely to love that which he regards as having the same interest with himself, and that of which the good or evil fortune is supposed by him at any time most to affect his own? Very true, he replied then there must be a selection. Let us note among the guardians those who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is for the good of their country, and the greatest repugnance to do what is against her interests. These are the right men. 
and they will have to be watched at every age, in order that we may see whether they preserve their resolution, and never, under the influence either of force or enchantment, forget or cast off their sense of duty to the state. How cast off, he said. I will explain to you, I replied. A resolution may go out of a man's mind either with his will or against his will. With his will when he gets rid of a falsehood and learns better, against his will whenever he is deprived of a truth. I understand, he said, the willing loss of a resolution. The meaning of the unwilling I have yet to learn. Why, I said, do you not see that men are unwillingly deprived of good and willingly of evil? Is not to have lost the truth an evil, and to possess the truth a good? And you would agree that to conceive things as they are is to possess the truth? Yes, he replied. I agree with you in thinking that mankind are deprived of truth against their will. And is not this involuntary deprivation caused either by theft, or force, or enchantment? Still, he replied, I do not understand you. I fear that I must have been talking darkly, like the tragedians. I only mean that some men are changed by persuasion, and that others forget. Argument steals away the hearts of one class, and time of the other. And this I call theft. Now you understand me? Yes. Those again who are forced are those whom the violence of some pain or grief compels to change their opinion. I understand, he said, and you are quite right. And you would also acknowledge that the enchanted are those who change their minds either under the softer influence of pleasure or the sterner influence of fear. Yes, he said, everything that deceives may be said to enchant. Therefore, as I was just now saying, we must inquire who are the best guardians of their own conviction, that what they think the interest of the state is to be the rule of their lives. We must watch them from their youth upwards, and make them perform actions in which they are most likely to forget, or to be deceived. And he who remembers and is not deceived is to be selected. He who fails in the trial is to be rejected. That will be the way? Yes. And there should also be toils and pains and conflicts prescribed for them, in which they will be made to give further proof of the same qualities. Very right, he replied. And then, I said, we must try them with enchantments, that is the third sort of test, and see what will be their behavior, like those who take colts amid noise and tumult to see if they are of a timid nature, so must we take our youth amid terrors of some kind, and again pass them into pleasures, and prove them more thoroughly than gold is proved in the furnace, that we may discover whether they are armed against all enchantments, and of a noble bearing always, good guardians of themselves and of the music which they have learned, and retaining under all circumstances a rhythmical and harmonious nature, such as will be most serviceable to the individual and to the state. And he who at every age, as boy and youth and in mature life, has come out of the trial victorious and pure, shall be appointed a ruler and guardian of the state. He shall be honored in life and death, and shall receive sepulture and other memorials of honor, the greatest that we have to give. But him who fails, we must reject. I am inclined to think that this is the sort of way in which our rulers and guardians should be chosen and appointed. I speak generally, and not with any pretension to exactness. And speaking generally, I agree with you, he said. And perhaps the word guardian in its fullest sense ought to be applied to this higher class only who preserve us against foreign enemies and maintain peace among our citizens at home, that the one may not have the will, or the others the power, to harm us. The young men whom we before called guardians may be more properly designated auxiliaries and supporters of the principles of the rulers. I agree with you, he said. How then may we devise one of those needful falsehoods of which we lately spoke? just one royal lie which may deceive the rulers, if that be possible, and at any rate the rest of the city. What sort of lie, he said. Nothing new, I replied. Only an old Phoenician tale of what has often occurred before now in other places, as the poets say, and have made the world believe, though not in our time. And I do not know whether such an event could ever happen again, or could now even be made probable if it did. How your words seem to hesitate on your lips. You will not wonder, I replied, at my hesitation when you have heard. Speak, he said, and fear not. Well, then, I will speak, although I really know not how to look you in the face, or in what words to utter the audacious fiction which I propose to communicate gradually, first to the rulers, then to the soldiers, and lastly to the people. They are to be told that their youth was a dream, and the education and training which they received from us an appearance only. 
In reality, during all that time, they were being formed and fed in the womb of the earth, where they themselves and their arms and appurtenances were manufactured. When they were completed, the earth, their mother, sent them up. And so, their country being their mother and also their nurse, they are bound to advise for her good, and to defend her against attacks, and her citizens they are to regard as children of the earth and their own brothers. You had good reason, he said, to be ashamed of the lie which you were going to tell. True, I replied, but there is more coming. I have only told you half. Citizens, we shall say to them in our tale, you are brothers, yet God has framed you differently. Some of you have the power of command, and in the composition of these he has mingled gold, wherefore also they have the greatest honor. Others he has made of silver to be auxiliaries. Others, again, who are to be husbandmen and craftsmen, he has composed of brass and iron, and the species will generally be preserved in the children. But as all are of the same original stock, a golden parent will sometimes have a silver son, or a silver parent a golden son, and God proclaims as a first principle to the rulers, and above all else, that there is nothing which they should so anxiously guard, or of which they are to be such good guardians, as the purity of the race. They should observe what elements mingle in their offspring, for if the son of a golden or silver parent has an admixture of brass and iron, then nature orders a transposition of ranks, and the eye of the ruler must not be pitiful toward the child because he has to descend in the scale and become a husbandman or artisan just as there may be sons of artisans who have an admixture of gold or silver in them, are raised to honor, and become guardians or auxiliaries. For an oracle says that when a man of brass or iron guards the state, it will be destroyed. Such is the tale. Is there any possibility of making our citizens believe in it? Not in this present generation, he replied. There is no way of accomplishing this. But their sons may be made to believe the tale, and their sons' sons, and posterity after them. I see the difficulty, I replied, yet the fostering of such a belief will make them care more for the city and for one another. Enough, however, of the fiction, which may now fly abroad upon the wings of rumor, while we arm our earth-born heroes, and lead them forth under the command of their rulers. Let them look round and select a spot whence they can best suppress insurrection, if any prove refractory within, and also defend themselves against enemies, who like wolves may come down on the fold from without. There let them encamp. And when they have encamped, let them sacrifice to the proper gods and prepare their dwellings. Just so, he said. And their dwellings must be such as will shield them against the cold of winter and the heat of summer. I suppose you mean houses, he replied. Yes, I said. But they must be the houses of soldiers, and not of shopkeepers. What is the difference, he said. That I will endeavor to explain, I replied. To keep watchdogs, who, from want of discipline or hunger, or some evil habit or other, would turn upon the sheep and worry them, and behave not like dogs but wolves, would be a foul and monstrous thing in a shepherd. Truly monstrous, he said. And therefore every care must be taken that our auxiliaries, being stronger than our citizens, may not grow to be too much for them and become savage tyrants instead of friends and allies. Yes, great care should be taken. And would not a really good education furnish the best safeguard? But they are well educated already, he replied. I cannot be so confident, my dear Glaucon, I said. I am much more certain that they ought to be, and that true education, whatever that may be, will have the greatest tendency to civilize and humanize them in their relations to one another, and to those who are under their protection. Very true, he replied. And not only their education, but their habitations, and all that belongs to them, should be such as will neither impair their virtue as guardians, nor tempt them to prey upon the other citizens. Any man of sense must acknowledge that. He must. Then now let us consider what will be their way of life, if they are to realize our idea of them. In the first place, none of them should have any property of his own beyond what is absolutely necessary. Neither should they have a private house or store closed against any one who has a mind to enter. Their provisions should be only such as are required by trained warriors, who are men of temperance and courage. They should agree to receive from the citizens a fixed rate of pay, enough to meet the expenses of the year, and no more. And they will go to mess and live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver we will tell them that they have from God. The diviner metal is within them, and they have therefore no need of the dross which is current among men, and ought not to pollute the divine by any such earthly admixture. For that commoner metal has been the source of many unholy deeds, but their own is undefiled and they alone of the citizens may not touch or handle silver or gold, 
or be under the same roof with them, or wear them, or drink from them. And this will be their salvation, and they will be the saviors of the state. But should they ever acquire homes, or lands, or monies of their own, they will become housekeepers and husbandmen instead of guardians, enemies and tyrants instead of allies of the other citizens. Hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against, they will pass their whole life in much greater terror of internal than of external enemies, and the hour of ruin, both to themselves and to the rest of the state, will be at hand. For all which reasons may we not say that thus shall our state be ordered, and that these shall be the regulations appointed by us for guardians concerning their houses, and all other matters? Yes, said Glaucon. End of Book 3 Recording by Jim Allman, Houston, Texas Book 4, Part 1 of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B. G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Book 4, Part 1. Here, Ademantus interposed a question. How would you answer, Socrates, said he, if a person were to say that you are making these people miserable, and that they are the cause of their own unhappiness? The city, in fact, belongs to them, but they are none the better for it. Whereas other men acquire lands, and build large and handsome houses, and have everything handsome about them, offering sacrifices to the gods on their own account, and practicing hospitality. Moreover, as you were saying just now, they have gold and silver, and all that is usual among the favorites of fortune. But our poor citizens are no better than mercenaries, who are quartered in the city, and are always mounting guard. Yes, I said, and you may add that they are only fed and not paid in addition to their food, like other men, and therefore they cannot, if they would, take a journey of pleasure. They have no money to spend on a mistress or any other luxurious fancy, which, as the world goes, is thought to be happiness, and many other accusations of the same nature might be added. But, he said, let us suppose all this to be included in the charge. You mean to ask, I said, what will be our answer? Yes. If we proceed along the old path, my belief, I said, is that we shall find the answer, and our answer will be that, even as they are, our guardians may very likely be the happiest of men, but that our aim in founding the state was not the disproportionate happiness of any one class, but the greatest happiness of the whole. We thought that in a state which is ordered with a view to the good of the whole, we should be most likely to find justice, and in the ill-ordered state, injustice. And, having found them, we might then decide which of the two is the happier. At present, I take it, we are fashioning the happy state, not piecemeal or with a view of making a few happy citizens, but as a whole. And by and by, we will proceed to view the opposite kind of state. Suppose that we are painting a statue, and someone came up to us and said, Why do you not put the most beautiful colors on the most beautiful parts of the body? The eyes ought to be purple, but you have made them black. To him we might fairly answer, Sir, you would not surely have us beautify the eyes to such a degree that they are no longer eyes? Consider rather whether by giving this and the other features their due proportion we make the whole beautiful. And so, I say to you, do not compel us to assign to the guardians a sort of happiness which will make them anything but guardians. For we too can clothe our husbandmen in royal apparel, and set crowns of gold on their heads, and bid them till the ground as much as they like, and no more. Our potters also might be allowed to repose on couches, and feast by the fireside, passing round the wine cup while their wheel is conveniently at hand, and working at pottery only as much as they like. In this way we might make every class happy, 
and then, as you imagine, the whole state would be happy. But do not put this idea into our heads, for if we listen to you, the husbandman will be no longer a husbandman, the potter will cease to be a potter, and no one will have the character of any distinct class in the state. Now this is not of much consequence, where the corruption of society and pretensions to be what you are not is confined to cobblers. But when the guardians of the laws and of the government are only seeming and not real guardians, then see how they turn the state upside down. And on the other hand, they alone have the power of giving order and happiness to the state. We mean our guardians to be true saviors and not the destroyers of the state, whereas our opponent is thinking of peasants at a festival who are enjoying a life of revelry, not of citizens who are doing their duty to the state. But if so, we mean different things, and he is speaking of something which is not a state. And therefore, we must consider whether in appointing our guardians we would look to their greatest happiness individually, or whether this principle of happiness does not rather reside in the state as a whole. But if the latter be the truth, then the guardians and auxiliaries, and all others equally with them, must be compelled or induced to do their own work in the best way, and thus the whole state will grow up in a noble order, and the several classes will receive the proportion of happiness which nature assigns to them. I think that you are quite right. I wonder whether you will agree with another remark which occurs to me. What may that be? There seem to be two causes of the deterioration of the arts. What are they? Wealth, I said, and poverty. How do they act? The process is as follows. When a potter becomes rich, will he, think you, any longer take the same pains with his art? Certainly not. He will grow more and more indolent and careless? Very true. And the result will be that he becomes a worse potter? Yes, he greatly deteriorates. But, on the other hand, if he has no money, and cannot provide himself with tools or instruments, he will not work equally well himself, nor will he teach his sons or apprentices to work equally well. Certainly not. Then, under the influence of either poverty or of wealth, workmen and their work are equally liable to degenerate. That is evident. Here, then, is a discovery of new evils, I said, against which the guardians will have to watch, or they will creep into the city unobserved. What evils? Wealth, I said, and poverty. The one is the parent of luxury and indolence, and the other of meanness and viciousness, and both of discontent. That is very true, he replied. But still I should like to know, Socrates, how our city will be able to go to war, especially against an enemy who is rich and powerful, if deprived of the sinews of war. There would certainly be a difficulty, I replied, in going to war with one such enemy. But there is no difficulty where there are two of them. How so? he asked. In the first place, I said, if we have to fight, our side will be trained warriors fighting against an army of rich men. That is true, he said. And do you not suppose, Ademantus, that a single boxer who is perfect in his art would easily be a match for two stout and well-to-do gentlemen who were not boxers? Hardly, if they came upon him at once. What now, I said, if he were able to run away and then turn and strike at the one who first came up? And supposing he were to do this several times under the heat of a scorching sun, might he not, being an expert, overturn more than one stout personage? Certainly, he said. There would be nothing wonderful in that. And yet, rich men probably have a greater superiority in the science and practice of boxing than they have in military qualities. Likely enough. Then we may assume that our athletes will be able to fight with two or three times their own number? I agree with you, for I think you are right. 
and supposing that, before engaging, our citizens send an embassy to one of the two cities, telling them what is the truth. Silver and gold we neither have nor are permitted to have, but you may. Do you therefore come and help us in war, and take the spoils of the other city? Who, on hearing these words, would choose to fight against lean, wiry dogs, rather than with the dogs on their side, against the fat and tender sheep? That is not likely, and yet there might be a danger to the poor state if the wealth of many states were to be gathered into one. But how simple of you to use the term state at all, of any but our own. Why so? You ought to speak of other states in the plural number. Not one of them is a city, but many cities, as they say in the game. For indeed, any city, however small, is in fact divided into two, one the city of the poor, the other of the rich. These are at war with one another, and in either there are many smaller divisions, and you would be altogether beside the mark if you treated them all as a single state. But if you deal with them as many, and give the wealth or power or persons of the one to the others, you will always have a great many friends and not many enemies. And your state, while the wise order which has now been prescribed continues to prevail in her, will be the greatest of states. I do not mean to say in reputation or appearance, but in deed and truth, though she number not more than a thousand defenders. A single state, which is her equal, you will hardly find, either among Hellens or barbarians, though many that appear to be as great and many times greater. That is most true, he said. And what, I said, will be the best limit for our rulers to fix when they are considering the size of the state and the amount of territory which they are to include, and beyond which they will not go. What limit would you propose? I would allow the state to increase so far as is consistent with unity. That, I think, is the proper limit. Very good, he said. Here, then, I said, is another order which will have to be conveyed to our guardians. Let our city be accounted neither large nor small, but one and self-sufficing. And surely, he said, this is not a very severe order which we impose upon them. And the other, said I, of which we are speaking before is lighter still. I mean the duty of degrading the offspring of the guardians when inferior, and of elevating into the rank of guardians the offspring of the lower classes when naturally superior. The intention was that in the case of the citizens generally, each individual should be put to the use for which nature intended him, one to one work, and then every man would do his own business, and be one and not many, and so the whole city would be one and not many. Yes, he said, that is not so difficult. The regulations which we are prescribing, my good Adimantos, are not, as might be supposed, a number of great principles, but trifles all, if care be taken, as the saying is, of the one great thing. A thing, however, which I would rather call not great, but sufficient for our purpose. What may that be? he asked. Education, I said, and nurture. If our citizens are well educated and grow into sensible men, they will easily see their way through all these, as well as other matters which I omit. Such, for example, as marriage, the possession of women, and the procreation of children, which will all follow the general principle that friends have all things in common, as the proverb says. That will be the best way of settling them. Also, I said, the state, if once started well, moves with accumulating force, like a wheel. For good nurture and education implant good constitutions, and these good constitutions, taking root in a good education, improve more and more. And this improvement affects the breed in man as in other animals. Very possibly, he said. Then to sum up, this is the point to which, above all, the attention of our rulers should be directed, that music and gymnastic be preserved in their original form, and no innovation made, 
they must do their utmost to maintain them intact. And when anyone says that mankind most regard the newest song which the singers have, they will be afraid that he may be praising not new songs, but a new kind of song. And this ought not to be praised, or conceived to be the meaning of the poet. For any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state, and ought to be prohibited. So Damon tells me, and I can quite believe him, he says that when modes of music change, the fundamental laws of the state always change with them. Yes, said Ademantus, and you may add my suffrage to Damon's and your own. Then, I said, our guardians must lay the foundations of their fortress in music? Yes, he said, the lawlessness of which you speak too easily steals in. Yes, I replied, in the form of amusement, and at first sight it appears harmless. Why, yes, he said, and there is no harm, were it not that little by little this spirit of license, finding a home, imperceptibly penetrates into manners and customs, whence, issuing with greater force, it invades contracts between man and man, and from contracts goes on to laws and constitutions in utter recklessness, ending at last, Socrates, by an overthrow of all rights, private as well as public. Is that true? I said. That is my belief, he replied. Then, as I was saying, our youth should be trained from the first in a stricter system, for if amusements become lawless, and the youths themselves become lawless, they can never grow up into well-conducted and virtuous citizens. Very true, he said. And when they have made a good beginning in play, and by the help of music have gained the habit of good order, then this habit of order, in a manner, how unlike the lawless play of the others, will accompany them in all their actions and be a principle of growth to them, and if there be any fallen places in the state, will raise them up again. Very true, he said. Thus educated, they will invent for themselves any lesser rules which their predecessors have altogether neglected. What do you mean? I mean such things as these, when the young are to be silent before their elders, how they are to show respect to them by standing and making them sit, what honor is due to parents, what garments or shoes are to be worn, the mode of dressing, the hair, deportment, and manners in general. You would agree with me? Yes. But there is, I think, small wisdom in legislating about such matters. I doubt if it is ever done, nor are any precise written enactments about them likely to be lasting. Impossible. It would seem, Ademantis, that the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future life. Does not like always attract like? To be sure until some one rare and grand result is reached, which may be good, and may be the reverse of good? That is not to be denied. And for this reason, I said, I shall not attempt to legislate further about them. Naturally enough, he replied. End of Book 4, Part 1 Recording by B.G. Oxford, December 2008《》Part Two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by B. G. Oxford.《The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Four, Part Two. Well, and about the business of the Agora and the ordinary dealings between man and man, or again about agreements with artisans, about insult and injury, or the commencement of actions, and the appointment of juries, what would you say? There may also arise questions about any impositions, and exactions of market and harbor dues which may be required, and in general about the regulations of markets, police, harbors, and the like. But, O oh heavens, Shall we condescend to legislate on any of these particulars? I think, he said, that there is no need to impose laws about them on good men, 
What regulations are necessary, they will find out soon enough for themselves. Yes, I said, my friend, if God will only preserve to them the laws which we have given them, and without divine help, said Ademantus, they will go on forever making and mending their laws and their lives in the hope of attaining perfection. You would compare them, I said, to those invalids who, having no self-restraint, will not leave off their habits of intemperance? Exactly. Yes, I said, and what a delightful life they lead. They are always doctoring and increasing and complicating their disorders, and always fancying that they will be cured by any nostrum which anybody advises them to try. Such cases are very common, he said, with invalids of this sort. Yes, I replied, and the charming thing is that they deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth, which is simply that unless they give up eating and drinking and wenching and idling, neither drug nor cautery nor spell nor amulet nor any other remedy will avail. Charming, he replied. I see nothing charming in going into a passion with a man who tells you what is right. These gentlemen, I said, do not seem to be in your good graces. Assuredly not. Nor would you praise the behavior of states, which act like the men whom I was just now describing. For are there not ill-ordered states in which the citizens are forbidden under pain of death to alter the Constitution? And yet he who most sweetly courts those who live under this regime and indulges them and fawns upon them and is skillful in anticipating and gratifying their humors is held to be a great and good statesman. Do not these states resemble the persons whom I was describing? Yes, he said, the states are as bad as the men, and I am very far from praising them. But do you not admire, I said, the coolness and dexterity of these ready ministers of political corruption? Yes, he said, I do, but not all of them, for there are some whom the applause of the multitude has deluded into the belief that they are really statesmen, and these are not much to be admired. What do you mean, I said? You should have more feeling for them. When a man cannot measure, and a great many others who cannot measure, declare that he is four cubits high, can he help believing what they say? Nay, he said, certainly not in that case. Well then, do not be angry with them, for are they not as good as a play, trying their hand at paltry reforms such as I was describing? They are always fancying that by legislation they will make an end of frauds in contracts and other rascalities which I was mentioning, not knowing that they are in reality cutting off the heads of a hydra. Yes, he said, that is just what they are doing. I conceive, I said, that the true legislator will not trouble himself with this class of enactments, whether concerning laws or the Constitution, either in an ill-ordered or in a well-ordered state. For in the former they are quite useless, and in the latter there will be no difficulty in devising them, and many of them will naturally flow out of our previous regulations. What then, he said, is still remaining to us of the work of legislation. Nothing to us, I replied, but to Apollo, the god of Delphi. There remains the ordering of the greatest and noblest and chiefest things of all. Which are they, he said? The institution of temples and sacrifices and the entire service of gods, demigods and heroes. Also the ordering of the repositories of the dead and the rites which have to be observed by him who would propitiate the inhabitants of the world below. These are matters of which we are ignorant ourselves, and as founders of a city we should be unwise in trusting them to any interpreter but our ancestral deity. He is the God who sits in the center, on the navel of the earth, and he is the interpreter of religion to all mankind. You are right, and we will do as you propose. But where, amid all this, is justice? Son of Ariston, tell me where. Now that our city has been made habitable, light a candle and search, and get your brother and Polymarchus and the rest of our friends to help, and let us see where in it we can discover justice, and where injustice, and in what they differ from one another, and which of them the man who would be happy should have for his portion. 
whether seen or unseen, by gods and men. Nonsense, said Glaucon. Did you not promise to search yourself, saying that for you not to help justice in her need would be an impiety? I do not deny that I said so, and as you remind me, I will be as good as my word, but you must join. We will, he replied. Well then, I hope to make the discovery in this way. I mean to begin with the assumption that our state, if rightly ordered, is perfect. That is most certain. And being perfect is therefore wise and valiant and temperate and just. That is likewise clear. And whichever of these qualities we find in the state, the one which is not found will be the residue. Very good. If there were four things, and we were searching for one of them, wherever it might be, the one sought for might be known to us from the first, and there would be no further trouble. Or we might know the other three first, and then the fourth would clearly be the one left. Very true, he said, and is not a similar method to be pursued about the virtues, which are also four in number. Clearly, First among the virtues found in the state, wisdom comes into view, and in this I detect a certain peculiarity. What is that? The state which we have been describing is said to be wise as being good in counsel? Very true. And good counsel is clearly a kind of knowledge, for not by ignorance but by knowledge do men counsel well? Clearly. And the kinds of knowledge in a state are many and diverse. Of course. There is the knowledge of the carpenter, but is that the sort of knowledge which gives a city the title of wise and good in counsel? Certainly not. That would only give a city the reputation of skill in carpentering. Then a city is not to be called wise because possessing a knowledge which counsels for the best about wooden implements? Certainly not, nor by reason of a knowledge which advises about brazen pots, I said, nor as possessing any other similar knowledge. Not by reason of any of them, he said, nor yet by reason of a knowledge which cultivates the earth that would give the city the name of agricultural. Yes. Well, I said, and is there any knowledge in our recently founded state among any of the citizens which advises not about any particular thing in the state, but about the whole, and considers how a state can best deal with itself and with other states? There certainly is. And what is this knowledge, and among whom is it found? I asked. It is the knowledge of the guardians, he replied, and is found among those whom we were just now describing as perfect guardians. And what is the name which the city derives from the possession of this sort of knowledge? The name of good in counsel and truly wise. And will there be in our city more of these true guardians or more smiths? The smiths, he replied, will be far more numerous. Will not the guardians be the smallest of all the classes who receive a name from the profession of some kind of knowledge? Much the smallest. And so by reason of the smallest part or class, and of the knowledge which resides in this presiding and ruling part of itself, the whole state, being thus constituted according to nature, will be wise. And this, which has the only knowledge worthy to be called wisdom, has been ordained by nature to be of all classes the least. Most true. Thus then, I said, the nature and place in the state of one of the four virtues has somehow or other been discovered, and in my humble opinion very satisfactorily discovered, he replied. Again, I said, there is no difficulty in seeing the nature of courage, and in what part that quality resides which gives the name of courageous to the state. How do you mean? Why, I said, every one who calls any state courageous or cowardly will be thinking of the part which fights and goes out to war on the state's behalf. No one, he replied, would ever think of any other. 
The rest of the citizens may be courageous or may be cowardly, but their courage or cowardice will not, as I conceive, have the effect of making the city either the one or the other. Certainly not. The city will be courageous in virtue of a portion of herself, which preserves under all circumstances that opinion about the nature of things to be feared and not to be feared, in which our legislator educated them. And this is what you term courage. I should like to hear what you are saying once more, for I do not think that I perfectly understand you. I mean that courage is a kind of salvation. Salvation of what? Of the opinion respecting things to be feared, what they are and of what nature, which the law implants through education. And I mean by the words, under all circumstances, to intimate that in pleasure or in pain, or under the influence of desire or fear, a man preserves and does not lose this opinion. Shall I give you an illustration? If you please. You know, I said, that dyers, when they want to dye wool for making the true sea purple, begin by selecting their white color first. This they prepare and dress with much care and pains in order that the white ground may take the purple hue in full perfection. The dyeing then proceeds, and whatever is dyed in this manner becomes a fast color, and no washing, either with lies or without them, can take away the bloom. But when the ground has not been duly prepared, you will have noticed how poor is the look either of purple or of any other color. Yes, he said, I know that they have a washed out and ridiculous appearance. Then now, I said, you will understand what our object was in selecting our soldiers and educating them in music and gymnastic. We were contriving influences which would prepare them to take the dye of the laws in perfection and the color of their opinion about dangers and of every other opinion was to be indelibly fixed by their nurture and training, not to be washed away by such potent lies as pleasure, mightier agent far in washing the soul than any soda or lie, or by sorrow, fear, and desire, the mightiest of all other solvents. And this sort of universal saving power of true opinion in conformity with law about real and false dangers I call and maintain to be courage, unless you disagree. But I agree, he replied, for I suppose that you mean to exclude mere uninstructed courage, such as that of a wild beast or of a slave. This, in your opinion, is not the courage which the law ordains, and ought to have another name. Most certainly. Then may I infer courage to be such as you describe? Why, yes, I said, you may. And if you add the words of a citizen, you will not be far wrong. Hereafter, if you like, we will carry the examination further. But at present we are seeking not for courage, but justice. And for the purpose of our inquiry, we have said enough. You are right, he replied. Two virtues remain to be discovered in the state. First, temperance, and then justice, which is the end of our search. Very true. Now, can we find justice without troubling ourselves about temperance? I do not know how that can be accomplished, he said, nor do I desire that justice should be brought to light and temperance lost sight of, and therefore I wish that you would do me the favor of considering temperance first. Certainly, I replied. I should not be justified in refusing your request. Then consider, he said. Yes, I replied, I will. And as far as I can at present see, the virtue of temperance has more of the nature of harmony and symphony than the preceding. How so, he asked. Temperance, I replied, is the ordering or controlling of certain pleasures and desires. This is curiously enough implied in the saying of a man being his own master, and other traces of the same notion may be found in language. No doubt, he said. There is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, for the master is also the servant, and the servant the master, 
and in all these modes of speaking the same person is denoted. Certainly. The meaning is, I believe, that in the human soul there is a better and also a worse principle. And when the better has the worse under control, then a man is said to be master of himself. And this is a term of praise. But when, owing to evil education or association, the better principle, which is also the smaller, is overwhelmed by the greater mass of the worse, in this case he is blamed and is called the slave of self and unprincipled. Yes, there is reason in that. And now, I said, look at our newly created state, and there you will find one of these two conditions realized. For the state, as you will acknowledge, may be justly called master of itself. If the words temperance and self-mastery truly express the rule of the better part over the worse. Yes, he said, I see that what you say is true. Let me further note that the manifold and complex pleasures and desires and pains are generally found in children and women and servants and in the free men so-called who are of the lowest and more numerous class. Certainly, he said, whereas the simple and moderate desires which follow reason and are under the guidance of mind and true opinion are to be found only in a few, and those the best born and best educated. Very true. These two, as you may perceive, have a place in our state and the meaner desires of the many are held down by the virtuous desires and wisdom of the few. That I perceive, he said. Then, if there be any city which may be described as master of its own pleasures and desires, and master of itself, ours may claim such a designation? Certainly, he replied. It may also be called temperate, and for the same reason? Yes. And if there be any state in which rulers and subjects will be agreed as to the question who are to rule, that again will be our state? Undoubtedly. And the citizens being thus agreed among themselves, in which class will temperance be found, in the rulers or in the subjects? In both, as I should imagine, he replied. Do you observe that we are not far wrong in our guess that temperance was a sort of harmony? Why so? Why? Because temperance is unlike courage and wisdom, each of which resides in a part only, the one making the state wise and the other valiant, not so temperance, which extends to the whole, and runs through all the notes of the scale, and produces a harmony of the weaker and the stronger and the middle class, whether you suppose them to be stronger or weaker in wisdom, or power, or numbers, or wealth, or anything else. Most truly, then, may we deem temperance to be the agreement of the naturally superior and inferior as to the right to rule of either, both in states and individuals. I entirely agree with you. And so, I said, we may consider three out of the four virtues to have been discovered in our state. The last of those qualities, which make a state virtuous, must be justice if we only knew what that was. The inference is obvious. End of Book 4, Part 2 Recording by B.G. Oxford December 2008Book 4, Part 3 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by B.G. Oxford. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book 4, Part 3. The time then has arrived, Glaucon, when, like huntsmen, we should surround the cover and look sharp that justice does not steal away and pass out of sight and escape us, for beyond a doubt she is somewhere in this country. Watch, therefore, and strive to catch a sight of her, and if you see her first, let me know. Would that I could, but you should regard me rather as a follower 
who has just eyes enough to see what you show him. That is about as much as I am good for. Offer up a prayer with me and follow. I will, but you must show me the way. There is no path, I said, and the wood is dark and perplexing. Still, we must push on. Let us push on. Here I saw something. Hello, I said. I began to perceive a track, and I believe that the quarry will not escape. Good news, he said. Truly, I said, we are stupid fellows. Why so? Why, my good sir, at the beginning of our inquiry, ages ago, there was justice tumbling out at our feet, and we never saw her. Nothing could be more ridiculous, like people who go about looking for what they have in their hands. That was the way with us. We looked not at what we were seeking, but at what was far off in the distance. And, therefore, I suppose we missed her. What do you mean? I mean to say that in reality, for a long time past, we have been talking of justice, and have failed to recognize her. I grow impatient at the length of your exordium. Well then, tell me, I said, whether I am right or not. You remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state, that one man should practice one thing only, the thing to which his nature was best adapted. Now justice is this principle, or part of it. Yes, we often said that one man should do one thing only. Further, we affirmed that justice was doing one's own business, and not being a busybody. We said so, again and again, and many others have said the same to us. Yes, we said so. Then to do one's own business in a certain way may be assumed to be justice. Can you tell me whence I derive this inference? I cannot, but I should like to be told. Because I think that this is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted, and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them and, while remaining in them, is also their preservative. And we were saying that, if the three were discovered by us, justice would be the fourth or remaining one. That follows of necessity. If we are asked to determine which of these four qualities, by its presence, contributes most to the excellence of the state, whether the agreement of rulers and subjects, or the preservation in the soldiers, of the opinion which the law ordains about the true nature of dangers, or wisdom and watchfulness in the rulers, or whether this other which I am mentioning, and which is found in children and women, slave and freeman, artisan, ruler, subject, the quality, I mean, of every one doing his own work, and not being a busybody, would claim the palm. The question is not so easily answered. Certainly, he replied there would be a difficulty in saying which. Then the power of each individual in the state to do his own work appears to compete with the other political virtues, wisdom, temperance, courage. Yes, he said. And the virtue which enters into this competition is justice? Exactly. Let us look at the question from another point of view. Are not the rulers in a state those to whom you would entrust the office of determining suits at law? Certainly. And are suits decided on any other ground but that a man may neither take what is another's nor be deprived of what is his own? Yes, that is their principle. Which is a just principle? Yes. Then on this view also, justice will be admitted to be the having and doing what is a man's own and belongs to him? Very true. Think now, and say whether you agree with me or not. Suppose a carpenter to be doing the business of a cobbler, or a cobbler of a carpenter, and suppose them to exchange their implements, or their duties, or the same person to be doing the work of both, or whatever be the change. Do you think that any great harm would result to the state? Not much. But when the cobbler, or any other man whom nature designed to be a trader, 
having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators and guardians for which he is unfitted and either to take the implements or the duties of the other or when one man is traitor legislator and warrior all in one then i think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state most true seeing then i said that there are three distinct classes any meddling of one with the other or the change of one to another is the greatest harm to the state and may be most justly termed evil doing precisely and the greatest degree of evil doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice certainly this then is injustice and on the other hand when the trader the auxiliary and the guardian each do their own business that is justice and will make the city just i agree with you we will not i said be over positive as yet but if on trial this conception of justice be verified in the individual as well as in the state there will be no longer any room for doubt if it be not verified we must have a fresh inquiry. First, let us complete the old investigation, which we began, as you remember, under the impression that if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale, there would be less difficulty in discerning her in the individual. That larger example appeared to be the state, and accordingly we constructed as good a one as we could, knowing well that in the good state justice would be found. Let the discovery which we made be now applied to the individual. If they agree, we shall be satisfied. Or if there be a difference in the individual, we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory. The friction of the two, when rubbed together, may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth, and the vision which is then revealed we will fix in our souls that will be in regular course let us do as you say i proceeded to ask when two things a greater and less are called by the same name are they like or unlike in so far as they are called the same like he replied the just man then if we regard the idea of justice only will be like the just state he will and the state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severally did their own business and also thought to be temperate and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes true he said and so of the individual we may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul which are found in the state and he may be rightly described in the same terms because he is affected in the same manner certainly he said once more then o oh my friend we have alighted upon an easy question whether the soul has these three principles or not an easy question nay rather socrates the proverb holds that hard is the good very true i said and i do not think that the method which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question the true method is another and a longer one still we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry may we not be satisfied with that he said under the circumstance i am quite content i too i replied shall be extremely well satisfied then faint not in pursuing the speculation he said must we not acknowledge i said that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state and that from the individual they pass into the state how else can they come there take the quality of passion or spirit it would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality when found in states is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it for example the thracians scythians and in general the northern nations and the same may be said of the love of knowledge which is the special characteristic of our part of the world or of the love of money 
which may with equal truth be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this. None whatever. But the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one, whether, that is to say, we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action to determine that is the difficulty. Yes, he said, there lies the difficulty. Then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different. How can we? he asked. I replied as follows. The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. And therefore, whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same, but different. Good. For example, I said, can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part? Impossible. Still, I said, let us have a more precise statement of terms, lest we should hereafter fall out by the way. Imagine the case of a man who is standing, and also moving his hands and his head, and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion, and at rest at the same moment. To such a mode of speech we should object, and should rather say that one part of him is in motion while another is at rest. Very true. And suppose the objector, to refine still further, and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of tops, but whole tops, when they spin around with their pegs fixed on the spot, are at rest and in motion at the same time, and he may say, the same of anything which revolves in the same spot. His objection would not be admitted by us, because, in such cases, things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves. We should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference, and that the axis stands still, for there is no deviation from the perpendicular, and that the circumference goes round. But if, while revolving, the axis inclines either to the right or left, forwards or backwards, then in no point of view can they be at rest. That is the correct mode of describing them, he replied. Then none of these objections will confuse us, or incline us to believe that the same thing, at the same time, in the same part, or in relation to the same thing, can act or be acted upon in contrary ways. Certainly not, according to my way of thinking. Yet, I said, that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections and prove at length that they are untrue, let us assume their absurdity and go forward on the understanding that hereafter, if this assumption turn out to be untrue, all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn. Yes, he said, that will be the best way. Well, I said, would you not allow that assent and dissent Desire and aversion, attraction and repulsion, are all of them opposites, whether they are regarded as active or passive, for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition. Yes, he said, they are opposites. Well, I said, and hunger and thirst, and the desires in general, and again willing and wishing, all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned. You would say, would you not? that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire, or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess. Or again, when a person wants anything to be given him, his mind, longing for the realization of his desire, intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent, as if he had been asked a question. Very true. And what would you say of unwillingness and dislike? and the absence of desire. Should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection? Certainly. Admitting this to be true of desire generally, 
let us suppose a particular class of desires and out of these we will select hunger and thirst as they are termed which are the most obvious of them let us take that class he said the object of one is food and of the other drink yes and here comes the point is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink and of drink only not of drink qualified by anything else for example warm or cold or much or little or in a word drink of any particular sort but if the thirst be accompanied by heat then the desire is of cold drink or if accompanied by cold then of warm drink or if the thirst be excessive then the drink which is desired will be excessive or if not great the quantity of drink will also be small but thirst pure and simple will desire drink pure and simple which is the natural satisfaction of thirst as food is of hunger yes he said the simple desire is as you say in every case of the simple object and the qualified desire of the qualified object but here a confusion may arise and i should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only but good drink or food only but good food for good is the universal object of desire and thirst being a desire will necessarily be thirst after good drink and the same is true of every other desire yes he replied the opponent might have something to say nevertheless i should still maintain that of relatives some have a quality attached to either term of the relation others are simple and have their correlatives simple i do not know what you mean well you know of course that the greater is relative to the less certainly and the much greater to the much less yes and the sometime greater to the sometime less and the greater that is to be to the less that is to be certainly he said and so of more and less and of other correlative terms such as the double and the half or again the heavier and the lighter the swifter and the slower and of hot and cold and of any other relatives is not this true of them all yes and does not the same principle hold in the sciences the object of science is knowledge assuming that to be the true definition but the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge i mean for example that the science of house building is a kind of knowledge which is defined and distinguished from other kinds and is therefore termed architecture certainly because it has a particular quality which no other has yes and it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind and this is true of the other arts and sciences yes end of book four part three recorded by b g oxford book four part four of plato's republic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by b g oxford the republic by plato translated by benjamin jowett book four part four now then if i have made myself clear you will understand my original meaning in what i said about relatives my meaning was that if one term of a relation is taken alone the other is taken alone if one term is qualified the other is also qualified i do not mean to say that relatives may not be disparate or that the science of health is healthy or of disease necessarily diseased or that the sciences of good and evil are therefore good and evil but only that when the term science is no longer used absolutely but has a qualified object which in this case is the nature of health and disease it becomes defined and is hence called not merely science but the science of medicine i quite understand and i think as you do would you not say that thirst is one of these essentially relative terms 
having clearly a relation, yes, thirst is relative to drink, and a certain kind of thirst is relative to a certain kind of drink. But thirst taken alone is neither of much nor little, nor of good nor bad, nor of any particular kind of drink, but of drink only? Certainly. Then the soul of the thirsty one, in so far as he is thirsty, desires only drink. For this he yearns, and tries to obtain it? That is plain. And if you suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink, that must be different from the thirsty principle, which draws him like a beast to drink. For, as we were saying, the same thing cannot at the same time, with the same part of itself, act in contrary ways about the same. Impossible. No more than you can say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time, but what you say is that one hand pushes and the other pulls. Exactly so, he replied. And might a man be thirsty and yet unwilling to drink? Yes, he said, it constantly happens. And in such a case, what is one to say? Would you not say that there was something in the soul bidding a man to drink, and something else forbidding him, which is other and stronger than the principle which bids him? I should say so. And the forbidding principle is derived from reason, and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and disease? Clearly. Then we may fairly assume that they are two, and that they differ from one another. The one with which a man reasons we may call the rational principle of the soul, the other with which he loves and hungers and thirsts and feels the flutterings of any other desire may be termed the irrational or appetitive, the ally of sundry pleasures and satisfactions? Yes, he said, we may fairly assume them to be different. Then let us finally determine that there are two principles existing in the soul. And what of passion or spirit? Is it a third or akin to one of the preceding? I should be inclined to say, akin to desire. Well, I said, there is a story which I remember to have heard, and in which I put faith. The story is that Leontios, the son of Aglion, coming up one day from the Piraeus, under the north wall on the outside, observed some dead bodies lying on the ground at the place of execution. He felt a desire to see them and also a dread and abhorrence of them. For a time he struggled and covered his eyes, but at length the desire got the better of him, and forcing them open, he ran up to the dead bodies, saying, Look, ye wretches, take your fill of the fair sight. I have heard the story myself, he said. The moral of the tale is that anger at times goes to war with desire, as though they were two distinct things. Yes, that is the meaning, he said. And are there not many other cases in which we observe that when a man's desires violently prevail over his reason, he reviles himself, and is angry at the violence within him, and that in this struggle, which is like the struggle of factions in a state, his spirit is on the side of his reason. But for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires, when reason decides that she should not be opposed, is a sort of thing which I believe that you never observed occurring in yourself, nor, as I should imagine, in any one else. Certainly not. Suppose that a man thinks he has done wrong to another. The nobler he is, the less able he is to feel indignant at any suffering, such as hunger or cold, or any other pain which the injured person may inflict upon him. These he deems to be just, and, as I say, his anger refuses to be excited by them. True, he said. But when he thinks that he is the sufferer of the wrong, then he boils and chafes, and is on the side of what he believes to be justice. And because he suffers hunger or cold or other pain, he is only the more determined to persevere and conquer. His noble spirit will not be quelled until he either slays or is slain, or until he hears the voice of the shepherd that is, reason, bidding his dog bark no more. The illustration is perfect, he replied, and in our state, as we were saying, 
the auxiliaries were to be dogs and to hear the voice of the rulers who are their shepherds i perceive i said that you quite understand me there is however a further point which i wish you to consider what point you remember that passion or spirit appeared at first sight to be a kind of desire but now we should say quite the contrary for in the conflict of the soul spirit is arrayed on the side of the rational principle most assuredly but a further question arises is passion different from reason also or only a kind of reason in which latter case instead of three principles in the soul there will only be two the rational and the concupiscent or rather as the state was composed of three classes traders auxiliaries counsellors so may there not be in the individual soul a third element which is passion or spirit and when not corrupted by bad education is the natural auxiliary of reason yes he said there must be a third yes i replied if passion which has already been shown to be different from desire turn out also to be different from reason but that is easily proved we may observe even in young children that they are full of spirit almost as soon as they are born whereas some of them never seem to attain the use of reason and most of them late enough excellent i said and you may see passion equally in brute animals which is a further proof of the truth of what you are saying and we may once more appeal to the words of homer which have been already quoted by us he smote his breast and thus rebuked his soul for in this verse homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreasoning anger which is rebuked by it very true he said and so after much tossing we have reached land and are fairly agreed that the same principles which exist in the state exist also in the individual and that they are three in number exactly must we not then infer that the individual is wise in the same way and in virtue of the same quality which makes the state wise certainly also that the same quality which constitutes courage in the state constitutes courage in the individual and that both the state and the individual bear the same relation to all the other virtues assuredly and the individual will be acknowledged by us to be just in the same way in which the state is just that follows of course we cannot but remember that the justice of the state consisted in each of the three classes doing the work of its own class we are not very likely to have forgotten he said we must recollect that the individual in whom the several qualities of his nature do their own work will be just and will do his own work yes he said we must remember that too and ought not the rational principle which is wise and has the care of the whole soul to rule and the passionate or spirited principle to be the subject and ally certainly and as we were saying the united influence of music and gymnastic will bring them into accord nerving and sustaining the reason with noble words and lessons and moderating and soothing and civilizing the wildness of passion by harmony and rhythm quite true he said and these two thus nurtured and educated and having learned truly to know their own functions will rule over the concupiscent which in each of us is the largest part of the soul and by nature most insatiable of gain over this they will keep guard lest waxing great and strong with the fullness of bodily pleasures as they are termed the concupiscent soul no longer confined to her own sphere should attempt to enslave and rule those who are not her natural born subjects and overturn the whole life of man very true he said both together will they not be the best defenders of the whole soul and the whole body against attacks from without the one counselling and the other fighting under his leader and courageously executing his commands and counsels true and he is to be deemed courageous whose spirit retains in pleasure and in pain the commands of reason about what he ought or ought not to fear 
Right, he replied. And him we call wise, who has in him that little part which rules and which proclaims these commands, that part, too, being supposed to have a knowledge of what is for the interest of each of the three parts and of the whole? Assuredly. And would you not say that he is temperate who has these same elements in friendly harmony, in whom the one ruling principle of reason and the two subject ones of spirit and desire are equally agreed that reason ought to rule and do not rebel? Certainly, he said, that is the true account of temperance, whether in the state or the individual. And surely, I said, we have explained again and again how, and by virtue of what quality, a man will be just. That is very certain. And is justice dimmer in the individual, and is her form different, or is she the same which we found her to be in the state? There is no difference in my opinion, he said. Because, if any doubt is still lingering in our minds, a few commonplace instances will satisfy us of the truth of what I am saying. What sort of instances do you mean? If the case is put to us, must we not admit that the just state, or the man who is trained in the principles of such a state, will be less likely than the unjust to make away with a deposit of gold or silver? Would any one deny this? No one, he replied. Will the just man or citizen ever be guilty of sacrilege or theft or treachery, either to his friends or to his country? Never neither will he ever break faith where there have been oaths or agreements? Impossible. No one will be less likely to commit adultery or to dishonor his father and mother or to fail in his religious duties? No one. And the reason is that each part of him is doing its own business, whether in ruling or being ruled? Exactly so. Are you satisfied, then, that the quality which makes such men and such states is justice, or do you hope to discover some other? Not I, indeed. Then our dream has been realized, and the suspicion which we entertained at the beginning of our work of construction, that some divine power must have conducted us to a primary form of justice, has now been verified? Yes, certainly. And the division of labor, which required the carpenter and the shoemaker and the rest of the citizens to be doing each his own business and not another's, was a shadow of justice, and for that reason it was of use? Clearly. But, in reality, justice was such as we were describing, being concerned, however, not with the outward man, but with the inward, which is the true self and concernment of man. For the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another, or any of them to do the work of others. He sets in order his own inner life, and is his own master, and his own law, and at peace with himself. And when he has bound together the three principles within him, which may be compared to the higher, lower, and middle notes of the scale, and the intermediate intervals, when he has bound all these together, and is no longer many, but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature, then he proceeds to act, if he has to act, whether in a matter of property, or in the treatment of the body, or in some affair of politics or private business, always thinking and calling that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition just and good action, and the knowledge which presides over it, wisdom and that which at any time impairs this condition he will call unjust action, and the opinion which presides over it, ignorance. You have said the exact truth, Socrates. Very good. And if we were to affirm that we had discovered the just man and the just state, and the nature of justice in each of them, we should not be telling a falsehood? Most certainly not. May we say so, then? Let us say so. And now, I said, injustice has to be considered. Clearly. Must not injustice be a strife which arises among the three principles, a meddlesomeness, and interference, and rising up of a part of the soul against the whole, 
an assertion of unlawful authority which is made by a rebellious subject against a true prince of whom he is the natural vassal what is all this confusion and delusion but injustice and intemperance and cowardice and ignorance and every form of vice exactly so and if the nature of justice and injustice be known then the meaning of acting unjustly and being unjust or again of acting justly will also be perfectly clear what do you mean he said why i said they are like disease and health being in the soul just what disease and health are in the body how so he said why i said that which is healthy causes health and that which is unhealthy causes disease yes and just actions cause justice and unjust actions cause injustice that is certain and the creation of health is the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the body and the creation of disease is the production of a state of things at variance with this natural order true and is not the creation of justice the institution of a natural order and government of one by another in the parts of the soul and the creation of injustice the production of a state of things at variance with the natural order exactly so he said then virtue is the health and beauty and well-being of the soul and vice the disease and weakness and deformity of the same true and do not good practices lead to virtue and evil practices to vice assuredly still our old question of the comparative advantage of justice and injustice has not been answered which is the more profitable to be just and act justly and practice virtue whether seen or unseen of gods and men or to be unjust and act unjustly if only unpunished and unreformed in my judgment socrates the question has now become ridiculous we know that when the bodily constitution is gone life is no longer endurable though pampered with all kinds of meats and drinks and having all wealth and power and shall we be told that when the very essence of the vital principle is undermined and corrupted life is still worth having to a man if only he be allowed to do whatever he likes with the single exception that he is not to acquire justice and virtue or to escape from injustice and vice assuming them both to be such as we have described yes i said the question is as you say ridiculous still as we are near the spot at which we may see the truth in the clearest manner with our own eyes let us not faint by the way certainly not he replied come up hither i said and behold the various forms of vice those of them i mean which are worth looking at i am following you he replied proceed i said the argument seems to have reached a height from which as from some tower of speculation a man may look down and see that virtue is one but that the forms of vice are innumerable there being four special ones which are deserving of note what do you mean he said i mean i replied that there appear to be as many forms of the soul as there are distinct forms of the state how many there are five of the state and five of the soul i said what are they the first i said it is that which we have been describing and which may be said to have two names monarchy and aristocracy accordingly as rule is exercised by one distinguished man or by many true he replied but i regard the two names as describing one form only for whether the government is in the hands of one or many if the governors have been trained in the manner which we have supposed the fundamental laws of the state will be maintained that is true he replied end of book four recording by b g oxford december two thousand eight book five part one of plato's republic this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part One. Such is the good and true city or state, and the good and true man is of the same pattern. And if this is right, every other is wrong, and the evil is one which affects not only the ordering of the state, but also the regulation of the individual soul, and is exhibited in four forms. What are they? he said. I was proceeding to tell the order in which the four evil forms appeared to me to succeed one another, when Polemarchus, who was sitting a little way off, just beyond Adamantus, began to whisper to him, stretching forth his hand, he took hold of the upper part of his coat by the shoulder, and drew him towards him, leaning forward himself so as to be quite close, and saying something in his ear, of which I only caught the words, Shall we let him off, or what shall we do? Certainly not, said Adamantus, raising his voice. Who is it, I said, to whom you are refusing to let off? You, he said. I repeated, Why am I especially not to be let off? Why, he said, we think that you are lazy, and mean to cheat us out of a whole chapter, which is a very important part of the story, and you fancy that we shall not notice your airy way of proceeding, as if it were self-evident to everybody, that in the matter of women and children, friends have all things in common. And was I not right, Adamantus? Yes, he said, but what is right in this particular case, like everything else, requires to be explained, for community may be of many kinds. Please, therefore, to say what kind of community you mean. We have been long expecting that you would tell us something about the family life of your citizens, how they will bring children into the world, and rear them when they have arrived, and, in general, what is the nature of this community of women and children, for we are of opinion that the right or wrong management of such matters will have a great and paramount influence on the state for good or for evil. And now, since the question is still undetermined, and you are taking in hand another state, we have resolved, as you heard, not to let you go, until you give an account of all this. To that resolution, said Glaucon, you may regard me as saying agreed. And without more ado, said Thrasymachus, you may consider us all to be equally agreed. I said, you know not what you are doing in thus assailing me. What an argument you are raising about the state! Just as I thought that I had finished, and was only too glad that I had laid this question to sleep, and was reflecting how fortunate I was in your acceptance of what I then said, you asked me to begin again at the very foundation, ignorant of what a hornet's nest of words you are stirring. Now I foresaw this gathering trouble, and avoided it. For what purpose do you conceive that we have come here, said Thrasymachus, to look for gold or to hear discourse? Yes, but discourse should have a limit. Yes, Socrates, said Glaucon, and the whole of life is the only limit which wise men assign to the hearing of such discourses. But never mind about us. Take heart yourself and answer the question in your own way. What sort of community of women and children is this which is to prevail among our guardians? And how shall we manage the period between birth and education, which seems to require the greatest care? Tell us how these things will be. Yes, my simple friend, but the answer is the reverse of easy. Many more doubts arise about this than about our previous conclusions. For the practicability of what is said may be doubted, and looked at in another point of view, whether the scheme, if ever so practicable, would be for the best, is also doubtful. Hence I feel a reluctance to approach the subject, lest our aspiration, my dear friend, should turn out to be a dream only. Fear not, he replied, for your audience will not be hard upon you. They are not sceptical or hostile. I said, My good friend, I suppose that you mean to encourage me by these words. Yes, he said. Then let me tell you that you are doing just the reverse. The encouragement which you offer would have been all very well, had I myself believed that I knew what I was talking about. To declare the truth about matters of high interest which a man honors and loves among wise men, who love him, need occasion no fear or faltering in his mind. But to carry on an argument, when you are yourself only a hesitating inquirer, which is my condition, is a dangerous and slippery thing, and the danger is not that I shall be laughed at, of which the fear would be childish, but that I shall miss the truth where I have most need to be sure of my footing, and drag my friends after me in my fall. And I pray, Nemesis, not to visit upon me the words which I am going to utter. 
for I do indeed believe that to be an involuntary homicide is less crime than to be a deceiver about beauty or goodness or justice in the matter of laws. And that is a risk which I would rather run among enemies than among friends, and therefore you do well to encourage me. Glaucon laughed and said, Well then, Socrates, in case you and your argument do us any serious injury, you shall be acquitted beforehand of the homicide, and shall not be held to be a deceiver. Take courage, then, and speak. Well, I said, the law says that when a man is acquitted he is free from guilt, and what holds at law may hold an argument. Then why should you mind? Well, I replied, I suppose that I must retrace my steps and say what I perhaps ought to have said before in the proper place. The part of the men has been played out, and now, properly enough, comes the turn of the women. Of them I will proceed to speak, and the more readily since I am invited by you. For men born and educated like our citizens, the only way, in my opinion, of arriving at a right conclusion about the possession and use of women and children, is to follow the path on which we originally started, when we said that the men were to be the guardians and the watchdogs of the herd. True. Let us further suppose the birth and education of our women to be subject to similar or nearly similar regulations. Then we shall see whether the result accords with our design. What do you mean? What I mean may be put in the form of a question. I said, Are dogs divided into he's and she's, or do they both share equally in hunting and in keeping watch and in all the other duties of dogs? Or do we entrust the males to the entire and exclusive care of the flocks, while we leave the females at home, under the idea that the bearing and suckling their puppies is labor enough for them? No, he said, they share alike. The only difference between them is that the males are stronger and the females weaker. But can you use different animals for the same purpose, unless they are bred and fed in the same way? You cannot. Then, if women are to have the same duties as men, they must have the same nurture and education. Yes. The education which was assigned to the men was music and gymnastic. Yes. Then women must be taught music and gymnastic, and also the art of war, which they must practice like the men. That is the inference, I suppose. I should rather expect, I said, that several of our proposals, if they are carried out, being unusual, may appear ridiculous. No doubt of it. Yes, and the most ridiculous thing of all will be the sight of women naked in the palestra, exercising with the men, especially when they are no longer young. They will certainly not be a vision of beauty, any more than the enthusiastic old men who, in spite of wrinkles and ugliness, continue to frequent the gymnasia. Yes, indeed, he said, according to present notions the proposal will be thought ridiculous. But then, I said, as we have determined to speak our minds, we must not fear the jests of the wits which will be directed against this sort of innovation, how they will talk of women's attainments both in music and gymnastic, and above all about their wearing armour and riding upon horseback. Very true, he replied. Yet having begun we must go forward to the rough places of the law, at the same time begging of these gentlemen, for once in their life, to be serious. Not long ago, as we shall remind them, the Hellenes were of the opinion, which is still generally received among the barbarians, that the sight of a naked man was ridiculous and improper, and when first the Cretans and then the Lacedaemonians introduced the custom, the wits of that day might equally have ridiculed the innovation. No doubt. But when experience showed that to let all things be uncovered was far better than to cover them up, and the ludicrous effect to the outward eye vanished before the better principle which reason asserted, then the man was perceived to be a fool who directs the shafts of his ridicule at any other sight but that of folly and vice, or seriously inclines to weigh the beautiful by any other standard but that of the good. Very true, he replied. First, then, whether the question is to be put in jest or in earnest, let us come to an understanding about the nature of woman. Is she capable of sharing either wholly or partially in the actions of men, or not at all? And is the art of war one of those arts in which she cannot share? That will be the best way of commencing the inquiry, and will probably lead to the fairest conclusion. That will be much the best way. Shall we take the other side first and begin by arguing against ourselves? In this manner the adversary's position will not be undefended. Why not? he said. Then let us put a speech into the mouths of our opponents. They will say, Socrates and Glaucon, no adversary need convict you, for you yourselves, at the first foundations of the state, admitted the principle that everybody was to do the one work suited to his own nature. 
and certainly, if I am not mistaken, such an admission was made by us. And do not the natures of men and women differ very much indeed? And we shall reply, of course they do. Then we shall be asked, whether the tasks assigned to men and to women should not be different, and such as are agreeable to their different natures? Certainly they should. But if so, have you not fallen into a serious inconsistency in saying that men and women, whose natures are so entirely different, ought to perform the same actions? What defence will you make for us, my good sir, against any one who offers these objections? That is not an easy question to answer when asked suddenly, and I shall and do beg of you to draw out the case on our side. These are the objections, Glaucon, and there are many others of a like kind, which I foresaw long ago. They made me afraid and reluctant to take in hand any law about the possession and nurture of women and children. By Zeus, he said, the problem to be solved is anything but easy. Why, yes, I said, but the fact is that when a man is out of his depth, whether he has fallen into a little swimming bath or into mid-ocean, he has to swim all the same. Very true. And must we not swim and try to reach the shore? We will hope that Arian's dolphin or some other miraculous help may save us. I suppose so, he said. Well, then, let us see if any way of escape can be found. We acknowledge, did we not, that different natures ought to have different pursuits, and that men's and women's natures are different. And now what are we saying? That different natures ought to have the same pursuits. This is the inconsistency which is charged upon us. Precisely. Verily, Glaucon, I said, glorious is the power of the art of contradiction. Why do you say so? Because I think that many a man falls into the practice against his will. When he thinks that he is reasoning, he is really disputing, just because he cannot define and divide, and so know that of which he is speaking, and he will pursue a merely verbal opposition in the spirit of contention, and not a fair discussion. Yes, he replied, such is very often the case, but what has that to do with us and our argument? A great deal, for there is certainly a danger of our getting unintentionally into a verbal opposition. In what way? Why, we valiantly and pugnaciously insist upon the verbal truth, that different natures ought to have different pursuits, but we never considered at all what was the meaning of sameness or difference of nature, or why we distinguish them when we assign different pursuits to different natures, and the same to the same natures. Why, no, he said, that was never considered by us. I said, suppose that by way of illustration we were to ask the question whether there is not an opposition in nature between bald men and hairy men, and if this is admitted by us, then, if bald men are cobblers, we should forbid the hairy men to be cobblers, and conversely? That would be a jest, he said. Yes, I said, a jest, and why? Because we never meant, when we constructed the state, that the opposition of nature should extend to every difference, but only to those differences which affected the pursuit in which the individual is engaged. We should have argued, for example, that a physician and one who is in mind a physician may be said to have the same nature. True whereas the physician and the carpenter have different natures. Certainly. And if, I said, the male and female sex appear to differ in their fitness for any art or pursuit, we should say that such pursuit or art ought to be assigned to one or the other of them. But if the difference consists only in women bearing and men begetting children, this does not amount to a proof that a woman differs from a man in respect of the sort of education she should receive, and we shall therefore continue to maintain that our guardians and their wives ought to have the same pursuits. Very true, he said. Next, we shall ask our opponent how, in reference to any of the pursuits or arts of civic life, the nature of a woman differs from that of a man. That will be quite fair. And perhaps he, like yourself, will reply that to give a sufficient answer on the instant is not easy, but after a little reflection there is no difficulty. Yes, perhaps. Suppose, then, that we invite him to accompany us in the argument, and then we may hope to show him that there is nothing peculiar in the constitution of women which would affect them in the administration of the state. By all means, let us say to him, Come now, and we will ask you a question. When you spoke of a nature gifted or not gifted in any respect, did you mean to say that one man will acquire a thing easily, another with difficulty? A little learning will lead the one to discover a great deal, whereas the other, after much study and application, no sooner learns than he forgets. Or, again, did you mean, that the one has a body which is a good servant to his mind, while the body of the other is a hindrance to him? 
Would not these be the sort of differences which distinguish the man gifted by nature from the one who is ungifted? No one will deny that. And can you mention any pursuit of mankind in which the male sex has not all these gifts and qualities in a higher degree than the female? Need I waste time in speaking of the art of weaving, and the management of pancakes and preserves, in which womankind does really appear to be great, and in which for her to be beaten by a man is of all things the most absurd? You are quite right, he replied, in maintaining the general inferiority of the female sex, although many women are in many things superior to many men, yet on the whole what you say is true. And if so, my friend, I said, there is no special faculty of administration in a state which a woman has because she is a woman, or which a man has by virtue of his sex, but the gifts of nature are alike diffused in both. All the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also, but in all of them a woman is inferior to a man. Very true. Then are we to impose all our enactments on men and none of them on women? That will never do. If a woman has a gift of healing, another not, one is a musician, and the other has no music in her nature? Very true. And one woman has a turn for gymnastic and military exercises, and another is unwarlike and hates gymnastics? Certainly. And one woman is a philosopher, and another is an enemy of philosophy. One has spirit, and another is without spirit? That is also true. Then one woman will have the temper of a guardian, and another not. Was not the selection of the male guardians determined by differences of this sort? Yes. Men and women alike possess the qualities which make a guardian. They differ only in their comparative strength or weakness. Obviously. And those women who have such qualities are to be selected as the companions and colleagues of men who have similar qualities, and whom they resemble in capacity and in character? Very true. And ought not the same natures to have the same pursuits? They ought. Then, as we were saying before, there is nothing unnatural in assigning music and gymnastic to the wives of the guardians. To that point we come round again. Certainly not. The law which we then enacted was agreeable to nature, and therefore not an impossibility or mere aspiration, and the contrary practice, which prevails at present, is in reality a violation of nature. That appears to be true. We had to consider first whether our proposals were possible, and secondly whether they were the most beneficial? Yes. And the possibility has been acknowledged? Yes. The very great benefit has next to be established? Quite so. You will admit that the same education which makes a man a good guardian will make a woman a good guardian, for their original nature is the same? Yes. End of Book 5, Part 1《Book Five, Part Two of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part Two. I should like to ask you a question. What is it? Would you say that all men are equal in excellence, or is one man better than another? The latter. And in the commonwealth which we were founding, do you conceive the guardians who have been brought up in our model system to be more perfect men, or the cobblers whose education has been cobbling? What a ridiculous question! You have answered me. I replied, Well, and may we not further say that our guardians are the best of our citizens? By far the best. And will not their wives be the best women? Yes, by far the best. And can there be anything better for the interests of the state than that the men and women of a state should be as good as possible? There can be nothing better. And this is what the arts of music and gymnastic, when present in such a manner as we have described, will accomplish? Certainly. Then we have made an enactment not only possible, but in the highest degree beneficial to the state? True. Then let the wives of our guardians strip, for their virtue will be their robe, and let them share in the toils of war and the defence of their country. Only in the distribution of labours the lighter are to be assigned to the women, who are the weaker natures, but in other respects their duties are to be the same. And as for the man who laughs at naked women exercising their bodies from the best of motives, in his laughter he is plucking, a fruit of unripe wisdom, and he himself is ignorant of what he is laughing at, or what he is about. For that is, and ever will be, the best of sayings, that the useful is the noble, and the hurtful is the base. 
Very true. Here, then, is one difficulty in our law about women, which we may say that we have now escaped. The wave has not swallowed us up alive for enacting that the guardians of either sex should have all their pursuits in common, to the utility and also to the possibility of this arrangement, the constancy of the argument with itself bears witness. Yes, that was a mighty wave which you have escaped. Yes, I said, but a greater is coming. You will not think much of this when you see the next. Go on, let me see. The law, I said, which is the sequel of this, and of all that has preceded, is to the following effect, that the wives of our guardians are to be common, and their children are to be common, and no parent is to know his own child, nor any child his parent. Yes, he said, that is a much greater wave than the other, and the possibility as well as the utility of such a law are far more questionable. I do not think, I said, that there can be any dispute about the very great utility of having wives and children in common. The possibility is quite another matter, and will be very much disputed. I think that a good many doubts may be raised about both. You imply that the two questions must be combined, I replied. Now I meant that you should admit the utility, and in this way, as I thought, I should escape from one of them, and then there would remain only the possibility. But that little attempt is detected, and therefore you will please to give a defense of both. Well, I said, I submit to my fate. Yet grant me a little favor. Let me feast my mind with a dream as daydreamers are in the habit of feasting themselves when they are walking alone, for before they have discovered any means of effecting their wishes, that is a matter which never troubles them, they would rather not tire themselves by thinking about possibilities, but assuming that what they desire is already granted to them. They proceed with their plan, and delight in detailing what they mean to do when their wishes come true. That is a way which they have of not doing much good to a capacity which was never good for much. Now I myself am beginning to lose heart, and I should like with your permission to pass over the question of possibility at present. Assuming, therefore, the possibility of the proposal, I shall now proceed to inquire how the rulers will carry out these arrangements, and I shall demonstrate that our plan, if executed, will be of the greatest benefit to the State and to the guardians. First of all, then, if you have no objection, I will endeavor with your help to consider the advantages of the measure, and hereafter the question of possibility. I have no objection. Proceed. First, I think that if our rulers and their auxiliaries are to be worthy of the name which they bear, there must be willingness to obey in the one, and the power of command in the other. The guardians must themselves obey the laws, and they must also imitate the spirit of them in any details which are entrusted to their care. That is right, he said. You, I said, who are their legislator, having selected the men, will now select the women and give them to them. They must be as far as possible of like natures with them, and they must live in common houses and meet at common meals. None of them will have anything specially his or her own. They will be together, and will be brought up together, and will associate at gymnastic exercises. And so they will be drawn by a necessity of their natures to have intercourse with each other. Necessity is not too strong a word, I think. Yes, he said, necessity, not geometrical, but another sort of necessity which lovers know, and which is far more convincing and constraining to the mass of mankind. True, I said, and this, Glaucon, like all the rest, must proceed after an orderly fashion. In a city of the blessed, licentiousness is an unholy thing which the rulers will forbid. Yes, he said, and it ought not to be permitted. Then clearly the next thing will be to make matrimony sacred in the highest degree, and what is most beneficial will be deemed sacred. Exactly. And how can marriages be made most beneficial? That is a question which I put to you, because I see in your house dogs for hunting, and of the nobler sort of birds not a few. Now I beseech you, do tell me, have you ever attended to their pairing and breeding? In what particulars? Why, in the first place, although they are all of a good sort, are not some better than others? True. And do you breed from them all indifferently, or do you take care to breed only from the best? From the best. And do you take the oldest, or the youngest, or only those of ripe age? I choose only those of ripe age. And if care was not taken in the breeding, your dogs and birds would greatly deteriorate? Certainly. And the same of horses and animals in general? Undoubtedly. Good heavens, my dear friend, I said, what consummate skill will our rulers need if the same principle holds of the human species? Certainly, the same principle holds. But why does this involve any particular skill? 
"'Because,' I said, "'our rulers will have often to practice upon the body corporate with medicines. "'Now you know that when patients do not require medicines, "'but have only to be put under a regimen, "'the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough. "'But when medicine has to be given, "'then the doctor should be more of a man.' "'That is quite true,' he said. "'But to what are you alluding?' "'I mean,' I replied, "'that our rulers will find a considerable dose of falsehood and deceit necessary for the good of their subjects. We were saying that the use of all these things regarded as medicines might be of advantage. And we were very right. And this lawful use of them seems likely to be often needed in the regulations of marriages and births. How so?' "'Why,' I said, "'the principle has been already laid down that the best of either sex should be united with the best as often.' and the inferior with the inferior, as seldom as possible, and that they should rear the offspring of the one sort of union, but not of the other, if the flock is to be maintained in first-rate condition. Now these goings-on must be a secret which the rulers only know, or there will be a farther danger of our herd, as the guardians may be termed, breaking out into rebellion. Very true. Had we not better appoint certain festivals at which we will bring together the brides and bridegrooms, and sacrifices will be offered, and suitable hymeneal songs composed by our poets. The number of weddings is a matter which must be left to the discretion of the rulers, whose aim will be to preserve the average of population. There are many other things which they will have to consider, such as the effects of wars and diseases and any similar agencies, in order as far as this is possible to prevent the state from becoming either too large or too small. Certainly, he replied. We shall have to invent some ingenious kind of lots which the less worthy may draw on each occasion of our bringing them together, and then they will accuse their own ill luck and not the rulers. To be sure, he said. And I think that our braver and better youth, besides their other honours and rewards, might have greater facilities of intercourse with women given them. Their bravery will be a reason, and such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible. True. And the proper officers, whether male or female or both, for offices are to be held by women as well as by men. Yes, the proper officers will take the offspring of the good parents to the pen or fold, and there they will deposit them with certain nurses who dwell in a separate quarter. But the offspring of the inferior, or of the better when they chance to be deformed, will be put away in some mysterious unknown place, as they should be. Yes, he said, that must be done if the breed of the guardians is to be kept pure." They will provide for their nurture, and will bring the mothers to the fold when they are full of milk, taking the greatest possible care that no mother recognizes her own child, and other wet nurses may be engaged if more are required. Care will also be taken that the process of suckling shall not be protracted too long, and the mothers will have no getting up at night or other trouble, but will hand over all this sort of thing to the nurses and attendants. You suppose the wives of our guardians to have a fine, easy time of it when they are having children, why, said I, and so they ought. Let us, however, proceed with our scheme. We were saying that the parents should be in the prime of life. Very true. And what is the prime of life? May it not be defined as a period of about twenty years in a woman's life, and thirty in a man's? Which years do you mean to include? A woman, I said, at twenty years of age, may begin to bear children to the state, and continue to bear them until forty. A man may begin at five-and-twenty, when he has passed the point at which the pulse of life beats quickest, and continue to beget children until he be fifty-five. Certainly, he said, both in men and women those years are the prime of physical as well as of intellectual vigor. Any one above or below the prescribed ages who takes a part in the public hymenals shall be said to have done an unholy and unrighteous thing. The child of which he is the father, if he steals it into life, will have been conceived under auspices very unlike the sacrifices and prayers, which at each hymeneal priestesses and priests the whole city will offer, that the new generation may be better and more useful than their good and useful parents, whereas his child will be the offspring of darkness and strange lust. Very true, he replied. And the same law will apply to any one of those within the prescribed age, who forms a connection with any woman in the prime of life, without the sanction of the rulers, for we shall say that he is raising up a bastard to the state, uncertified and unconsecrated. Very true, he replied. This applies, however, only to those who are within the specified age. After that we will allow them to range at will, except that a man may not marry his daughter or his daughter's daughter, or his mother or his mother's mother, 
and women, on the other hand, are prohibited from marrying their sons or fathers, or son's son or father's father, and so on in either direction. And we grant all this, accompanying the permission with strict orders to prevent any embryo which may come into being from seeing the light, and if any force away to the birth, the parents must understand that the offspring of such an union cannot be maintained, and arrange accordingly. That so, he said, is a reasonable proposition. But how will they know who are fathers and daughters, and so on? They will never know. The way will be this. Dating from the day of the hymeneal, the bridegroom who was then married will call all the male children who are born in the seventh and tenth month afterwards his sons, and the female children his daughters, and they will call him father. And he will call their children his grandchildren, and they will call the elder generation fathers and grandmothers. All who were begotten at the time when their fathers and mothers came together will be called their brothers and sisters, and these, as I was saying, will be forbidden to intermarry. This, however, is not to be understood as an absolute prohibition of the marriage of brothers and sisters. If the lot favors them, and they receive the sanction of the Pythian oracle, the law will allow them. Quite right, he replied. Such is the scheme, Glaucon, according to which the guardians of our state are to have their wives and families in common. And now you would have the argument show that this community is consistent with the rest of our polity, and also that nothing can be better, would you not? Yes, certainly. Shall we try to find a common basis by asking of ourselves what ought to be the chief aim of the legislator in making laws, and in the organization of a state? What is the greatest good, and what is the greatest evil? And then consider whether our previous description has the stamp of the good or of the evil? By all means. Can there be any greater evil than discord and distraction and plurality where unity ought to reign? Or any greater good than the bond of unity? There cannot. And there is unity where there is community of pleasures and pains, where all the citizens are glad or grieved on the same occasions of joy and sorrow? No doubt. Yes, and where there is no common but only private feeling, a state is disorganized. When you have one half of the world triumphing and the other half plunged in grief at the same events happening to the city or the citizens? Certainly. Such differences commonly originate in a disagreement about the use of the terms mine and not mine, his and not his. Exactly so. And is not that the best ordered state in which the greatest number of persons apply the terms mine and not mine in the same way to the same thing? Quite true or that again which most nearly approaches to the condition of the individual, as in the body, but when a finger of one of us is hurt, the whole frame, drawn towards the soul as a centre and forming one kingdom under the ruling power therein, feels the hurt and sympathizes altogether with the part affected, and we say that the man has a pain in his finger, and that the same expression is used about any other part of the body, which has a sensation of pain at suffering, or of pleasure at the alleviation of suffering. Very true, he replied, and I agree with you that in the best ordered state there is the nearest approach to this common feeling, which you describe. Then when any one of the citizens experiences any good or evil, the whole state will make his case their own, and will either rejoice or sorrow with him? Yes, he said, that is what will happen in a well-ordered state. It will now be time, I said, for us to return to our state and see whether this or some other is most in accordance with these fundamental principles. Very good. Our state, like every other, has rulers and subjects? True. All of whom will call one another citizens? Of course. But is there not another name which people give to their rulers in other states? Generally they call them masters, but in democratic states they simply call them rulers. And in our state, what other name besides that of citizens do the people give the rulers? They are called saviors and helpers, he replied. And what do the rulers call the people? They are maintainers and foster fathers. And what do they call them in other states? Slaves. And what do the rulers call one another in other states? Fellow rulers. And what in ours? Fellow guardians. Did you ever know an example in any other state of a ruler who would speak of one of his colleagues as his friend, and of another as not being his friend? Yes, very often. And the friend he regards and describes as one in whom he has an interest, and the other as a stranger in whom he has no interest. Exactly. But would any of your guardians think or speak of any other guardian as a stranger? Certainly he would not, for every one whom they meet will be regarded by them as either brother or sister, 
or father or mother, or son or daughter, or as the child or parent of those who are thus connected with him. Capital, I said, but let me ask you once more. Shall they be a family in name only, or shall they in all their actions be true to the name? For example, in the use of the word father, would the care of a father be implied, and the filial reverence and duty and obedience to him, which the law commands, and is the violator of these duties, to be regarded as an impious and unrighteous person, who is not likely to receive much good either at the hands of God or of man? Are these to be, or not to be, the strains which the children will hear repeated in their ears, by all the citizens, about those who are intimated to them to be their parents and the rest of their kinsfolk? These, he said, and none other, for what can be more ridiculous than for them to utter the names of family ties with the lips only, and not to act in the spirit of them? End of Book 5, Part 2《Book Five, Part Three of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part Three. Then in our city, the language of harmony and concord will be more often heard than in any other. As I was describing before, when any one is well or ill. The universal word will be, with me it is well, or it is ill. Most true. And agreeably to this mode of thinking and speaking, were we not saying that they will have their pleasures and pains in common? Yes, and so they will. And they will have a common interest in the same thing, which they will all alike call my own, and having this common interest they will have a common feeling of pleasure and pain. Yes, far more so than in other states." And the reason of this, over and above the general constitution of the state, will be that the guardians will have a community of women and children? That will be the chief reason. And this unity of feeling we admitted to be the greatest good, as was implied in our own comparison of a well-ordered state to the relation of the body and the members, when affected by pleasure or pain? That we acknowledge, and very rightly. Then the community of wives and children among our citizens is clearly the source of the greatest good to the state? Certainly. And this agrees with the other principle which we were affirming, that the guardians were not to have houses or lands or any other property. Their pay was to be their food, which they were to receive from the other citizens, and they were to have no private expenses, for we intended them to preserve their true character of guardians. Right, he replied. Both the community of property and the community of families, as I am saying, tend to make them more truly guardians. They will not tear the city in pieces by differing about mine and not mine, each man dragging any acquisition which he has made into a separate house of his own, where he has a separate wife and children and private pleasures and pains, but all will be affected as far as may be by the same pleasures and pains, because they are all of one opinion about what is near and dear to them, and therefore they all tend toward a common end. Certainly, he replied, and as they have nothing but their persons which they can call their own, suits and complaints will have no existence among them. They will be delivered from all those quarrels of which money or children or relations are the occasion. Of course they will. Neither will trials for assault or insult ever be likely to occur among them. For that equals should defend themselves against equals we shall maintain to be honourable and right. We shall make the protection of the person a matter of necessity." That is good, he said. Yes, and there is a further good in the law, viz., that if a man has a quarrel with another, he will satisfy his resentment then and there, and not proceed to more dangerous lengths. Certainly. To the elder shall be assigned the duty of ruling and chastising the younger. Clearly. Nor can there be a doubt that the younger will not strike or do any other violence to an elder, unless the magistrates command him, nor will he slight him in any way. For there are two guardians, shame and fear, mighty to prevent him, shame which makes men refrain from laying hands on those who are to them in the relation of parents, fear that the injured one will be succoured by the others who are his brothers, sons, fathers. That is true, he replied. Then in every way the laws will help the citizens to keep the peace with one another. Yes, there will be no want of peace. And as the guardians will never quarrel among themselves, there will be no danger of the rest of the city being divided, either against them or against one another. None whatever. I hardly like even to mention the little meannesses of which they will be rid, 
for they are beneath notice, such, for example, as the flattery of the rich by the poor, and all the pains and pangs which men experience in bringing up a family, and in finding money to buy necessaries for their household, borrowing and then repudiating, getting how they can, and giving money into the hands of women and slaves to keep. The many evils of so many kinds, which people suffer in this way, are mean enough and obvious enough, and not worth speaking of. Yes, he said, a man has no need of eyes in order to perceive that. And from all these evils they will be delivered, and their life will be blessed as the life of Olympic victors, and yet more blessed. How so? The Olympic victor, I said, is deemed happy in receiving part only of the blessedness which is secured to our citizens, who have won a more glorious victory, and have a more complete maintenance at the public cost. For the victory which they have won is the salvation of the whole state, and the crown with which they and their children are crowned is the fullness of all that life needs. They receive rewards from the hands of their country while living, and after death have an honorable burial. Yes, he said, and glorious rewards they are. Do you remember, I said, how in the course of the previous discussion some one who shall be nameless accused us of making our guardians unhappy? They had nothing, and might have possessed all things. To whom we replied that, if an occasion offered, we might perhaps hereafter consider this question, but that, as at present advised, we would make our guardians truly guardians, and that we were fashioning the state with a view to the greatest happiness, not of any particular class, but of the whole. Yes, I remember. And what do you say, now that the life of our protectors is made out to be far better and nobler than that of Olympic victors? Is the life of shoemakers, or any other artisans, or of husbandmen, to be compared with it? Certainly not. At the same time I ought here to repeat what I have said elsewhere, that if any of our guardians shall try to be happy in such a manner that he will cease to be a guardian, and is not content with this safe and harmonious life, which in our judgment is of all lives the best, but infatuated by some youthful conceit of happiness which gets up into his head, shall seek to appropriate the whole state to himself, then he will have to learn how wisely Hesiod spoke, when he said, Half is more than the whole. If he were to consult me, I should say to him, Stay where you are, when you have the offer of such a life. You agree, then, I said, that men and women are to have a common way of life such as we have described, common education, common children, and they are to watch over the citizens in common, whether abiding in the city or going out to war. They are to keep watch together, and to hunt together like dogs, and always, and in all things, as far as they are able, women are to share with the men, and in so doing they will do what is best, and will not violate, but preserve the natural relation of the sexes. I agree with you, he replied. The inquiry, I said, has yet to be made, whether such a community be found possible, as among other animals, so also among men, and if possible, in what way possible? You have anticipated the question which I was about to suggest. There is no difficulty, I said, in seeing how war will be carried on by them. How? Why, of course they will go on expeditions together, and will take with them any of their children who are strong enough, that after the manner of the artisan's child they may look on at the work which they will have to do when they are grown up, and besides looking on they will have to help and be of use in war, and to wait upon their fathers and mothers. Did you never observe in the arts how the potter's boys look on and help, long before they touch the wheel? Yes, I have. And shall potters be more careful in educating their children, and in giving them the opportunity of seeing and practicing their duties, than our guardians will be? The idea is ridiculous, he said. There is also the effect on the parents, with whom, as with other animals, the presence of their young ones will be the greatest incentive to valor. That is quite true, Socrates, and yet if they are defeated, which may often happen in war, how great the danger is! The children will be lost as well as their parents, and the state will never recover. True, I said, but would you never allow them to run any risk? I am far from saying that. Well, but if they are ever to run a risk, should they not do so on some occasion when, if they escape disaster, they will be the better for it? Clearly. Whether the future soldiers do or do not see war in the days of their youth is a very important matter, for the sake of which some risk may be fairly incurred. Yes, very important. This, then, must be our first step, to make our children spectators of war, but we must also contrive that they shall be secured against danger, then all will be well. True. 
their parents may be supposed not to be blind to the risks of war, but to know, as far as human foresight can, what expeditions are safe and what dangerous? That may be assumed. And they will take them on the safe expeditions and be cautious about the dangerous ones? True. And they will place them under the command of experienced veterans who will be their leaders and teachers? Very properly. Still, the dangers of war cannot be always foreseen. There is a good deal of chance about them. True. Then against such chances the children must be at once furnished with wings, in order that in the hour of need they may fly away and escape. What do you mean? he said. I mean that we must mount them on horses in their earliest youth, and when they have learnt to ride, take them on horseback to see war. The horses must not be spirited and warlike, but the most tractable and yet the swiftest that can be had. In this way they will get an excellent view of what is hereafter to be their own business, and if there is danger they have only to follow their elder leaders and escape. "'I believe you are right,' he said. "'Next, as to war, what are to be the relations of your soldiers to one another and to their enemies? I should be inclined to propose that the soldier who leaves his rank, or throws away his arms, or is guilty of any other act of cowardice, should be degraded into the rank of a husbandman and artisan. What do you think?' "'By all means, I should say. "'And he who allows himself to be taken prisoner "'may as well be made a present of to his enemies. "'He is their lawful prey, "'and let them do what they like with him. "'Certainly. "'But the hero who has distinguished himself, "'what shall be done to him? "'In the first place, "'he shall receive honour in the army from his youthful comrades. "'Every one of them in succession shall crown him. "'What do you say? "'I approve. "'And what do you say to his receiving the right hand of fellowship?' To that, too, I agree. But you will hardly agree to my next proposal. What is your proposal? That he should kiss and be kissed by them. Most certainly, and I should be disposed to go further, and say, let no one whom he has a mind to kiss refuse to be kissed by him while the expedition lasts, so that if there be a lover in the army, whether his love be youth or maiden, he may be more eager to win the prize of valour. Capital, I said, that the brave man is to have more wives than others has been already determined, and he is to have first choices in such matters more than others, in order that he may have as many children as possible. Agreed. Again, there is another manner in which, according to Homer, brave youths should be honoured, for he tells how Ajax, after he had distinguished himself in battle, was rewarded with long chains, which seems to be a compliment appropriate to a hero in the flower of his age, being not only a tribute of honour, but also a very strengthening thing. Most true, he said. Then in this, I said, Homer shall be our teacher, and we too, at sacrifices, and on the like occasions, will honour the brave according to the measure of their valour, whether men or women, with hymns and those other distinctions which we were mentioning, also with seats of precedence and meats and full cups, and in honouring them we shall be at the same time training them. That, he replied, is excellent. Yes, I said, and when a man dies gloriously in war, shall we not say, in the first place, that he is of the golden race? To be sure. Nay, have we not the authority of Hesiod for affirming that, when they are dead, they are holy angels upon the earth, authors of good, averters of evil, the guardians of speech-gifted men? Yes, and we accept his authority. We must learn of the God how we are to order the sepulture of divine and heroic personages, and what is to be their special distinction, and we must do as he bids? By all means. And in ages to come we will reverence them and kneel before their sepulchres as at the graves of heroes, and not only they, but any who are deemed preeminently good, whether they die from age, or in any other way, shall be admitted to the same honours. That is very right, he said. Next, how shall our soldiers treat their enemies? What about this? In what respect do you mean? First of all, in regard to slavery, do you think it right that Hellenes should enslave Hellenic states, or allow others to enslave them, if they can help? Should not their custom be to spare them, considering the danger which there is that the whole race may one day fall under the yoke of the barbarians? To spare them is infinitely better. Then no Hellene should be owned by them as a slave. That is a rule which they will observe, and advise the other Hellenes to observe. Certainly, he said, they will in this way be united against the barbarians, and will keep their hands off one another. Next, as to the slain, ought the conquerors, I said, to take anything but their armour? Does not the practice of despoiling an enemy afford an excuse for not facing the battle? Cowards skulk about the dead, 
pretending that they are fulfilling a duty, and many an army before now has been lost from this love of plunder. Very true. And is there not illiberality and avarice in robbing a corpse, and also a degree of meanness and womanishness in making an enemy of the dead body, when the real enemy has flown away, and left only his fighting-gear behind him? Is not this rather like a dog who cannot get at his assailant, quarrelling with the stones which strike him instead? Very like a dog, he said. Then we must abstain from spoiling the dead or hindering their burial. Yes, he replied, we most certainly must. Neither shall we offer up arms at the temples of the gods, least of all the arms of Hellenes, if we care to maintain good feeling with other Hellenes, and, indeed, we have reason to fear that the offering of spoils taken from kinsmen may be a pollution unless commanded by the god himself? Very true. Again, as to the devastation of Hellenic territory, or the burning of houses, what is to be the practice? May I have the pleasure, he said, of hearing your opinion? Both should be forbidden, in my judgment. I would take the annual produce and no more. Shall I tell you why? Pray do. Why, you see, there is a difference in the names discord and war, and I imagine that there is also a difference in their natures. The one is expressive of what is internal and domestic, the other of what is external and foreign, and the first of the two is termed discord, and only the second war. That is a very proper distinction, he replied. And may I not observe with equal propriety that the Hellenic race is all united together by ties of blood and friendship, and alien and strange to the barbarians? Very good, he said. And therefore, when Hellenes fight with barbarians, and barbarians with Hellenes, they will be described by us as being at war when they fight, and by nature enemies, and this kind of antagonism should be called war. But when Hellenes fight with one another, we shall say that Hellas is then in a state of disorder and discord, they being by nature friends, and such enmity is to be called discord. I agree. Consider then, I said, when that which we have acknowledged to be discord occurs, and a city is divided, if both parties destroy the lands and burn the houses of one another, how wicked does the strife appear! No true lover of his country would bring himself to tear in pieces his own nurse and mother. There might be reason in the conqueror depriving the conquered of their harvest, but still they would have the idea of peace in their hearts, and would not mean to go on fighting for ever. Yes, he said, that is a better temper than the other. And will not the city, which you are founding, be an Hellenic city? It ought to be, he replied. Then will not the citizens be good and civilized? Yes, very civilized. And will they not be lovers of Hellas, and think of Hellas as their own land, and share in the common temples? Most certainly. And any difference which arises among them will be regarded by them as discord only, a quarrel among friends, which is not to be called a war? Certainly not. Then they will quarrel as those who intend some day to be reconciled? Certainly. They will use friendly correction, but will not enslave or destroy their opponents. They will be correctors, not enemies? Just so. And as they are Hellenes themselves, they will not devastate Hellas, nor will they burn houses, nor ever suppose that the whole population of a city, men, women, and children, are equally their enemies, for they know that the guilt of war is always confined to a few persons, and that the many are their friends. And for all these reasons they will be unwilling to waste their lands, and raise their houses. Their enmity to them will only last until the many innocent sufferers have compelled the guilty few to give satisfaction. I agree, he said, that our citizens should thus deal with their Hellenic enemies, and with barbarians as the Hellenes now deal with one another. Then let us enact this law also for our guardians, that they are neither to devastate the lands of Hellenes, nor to burn their houses. Agreed, and we may agree also in thinking that these, like all our previous enactments, are very good. End of Book 5, Part 3《Book Five, Part Four of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Five, Part Four. But still, I must say, Socrates, that if you are allowed to go on in this way, you will entirely forget the other question, which at the commencement of this discussion you thrust aside. Is such an order of things possible, and how, if at all? For I am quite ready to acknowledge that the plan which you propose, if only feasible, 
would do all sorts of good to the state. I will add, what you have omitted, that your citizens will be the bravest of warriors, and will never leave their ranks, for they will all know one another, and each will call the other father, brother, son. And if you suppose the women to join the armies, whether in the same rank or in the rear, either as a terror to the enemy, or as auxiliaries in case of need, I know that they will then be absolutely invincible, and there are many domestic advantages which might also be mentioned, and which I also fully acknowledge. But as I admit all these advantages, and as many more as you please, if only this state of yours were to come into existence, we need say no more about them, assuming, then, the existence of the state. Now let us turn to the question of possibility and ways and means. The rest may be left." If I loiter for a moment, you instantly make a raid upon me, I said, and have no mercy, I have hardly escaped the first and second waves, and you seem not to be aware that you are now bringing upon me the third, which is the greatest and heaviest. When you have seen and heard the third wave, I think you will be more considerate and will acknowledge that some fear and hesitation was natural, respecting a proposal so extraordinary as that which I have now to state and investigate. The more appeals of this sort which you make, he said, the more determined are we that you shall teach us how such a state is possible. Speak out, and at once. Let me begin by reminding you that we found our way hither in the search after justice and injustice. True, he replied, but what of that? I was only going to ask whether, if we have discovered them, we are to require that the just man should in nothing fail of absolute justice, or may we be satisfied with an approximation, and the attainment in him of a higher degree of justice than is to be found in other men. The approximation will be enough. We were inquiring into the nature of absolute justice, and into the character of the perfectly just, and into injustice and the perfectly unjust, that we might have an idea. We were to look at these in order that we might judge of our own happiness and unhappiness according to the standard which they exhibited, and the degree in which we resembled them, but not with any view of showing that they could exist in fact. True, he said. Would a painter be any worse because, after having delineated with consummate art an ideal of a perfectly beautiful man, he was unable to show that any such man could ever have existed? He would be none the worse. Well, and were we not creating an ideal of a perfect state? To be sure. And is our theory a worse theory because we are unable to prove the possibility of a city being ordered in the manner described? Surely not, he replied. That is the truth, I said. But if at your request I am to try and show how and under what conditions the possibility is highest, I must ask you, having this in view, to repeat your former admissions. What admissions? I want to know whether ideals are ever fully realized in language. Does not the word express more than the fact, and must not the actual, whatever a man may think, always in the nature of things, fall short of the truth? What do you say? I agree. Then you must not insist on my proving that the actual state will, in every respect, coincide with the ideal. If we are only able to discover how a city may be governed as nearly as we proposed, you will admit that we have discovered the possibility which you demand, and will be contented. I am sure that I should be contented. Will not you? Yes, I will. Let me next endeavor to show what is that fault in states which is the cause of their present maladministration, and what is the least change which will enable a state to pass into the truer form, and let the change, if possible, be of one thing only, or if not, of two. At any rate, let the changes be as few and slight as possible. Certainly, he replied. I think, I said, that there might be a reform of the state, if only one change were made, which is not a slight or an easy, though a still possible one. What is it? he said. Now then, I said, I go to meet that which I liken to the greatest of the waves. Yet shall the word be spoken, even though the wave break and drown me in laughter and dishonor, and do you mark my words? Proceed. I said, Until philosophers are kings, or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and political greatness and wisdom meet in one, and those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside, cities will never have rest from their evils, nor the human race, as I believe, and then only will this our state have a possibility of life and behold the light of day. Such was the thought, my dear Glaucon, which I would fain have uttered if it had not seemed too extravagant, for to be convinced that in no other state can there be happiness, private or public, is indeed a hard thing. 
"'Socrates, what do you mean? I would have you consider that the word which you have uttered is one at which numerous persons, and very respectable persons, too, in a figure pulling off their coats all in a moment, and seizing any weapon that comes to hand, will run you at might and main, before you know where you are, intending to do heaven knows what, and if you don't prepare an answer, and put yourself in motion, you will be paired by their fine wits, and no mistake.' "'You got me into a scrape,' I said. "'And I was quite right. However, I will do all I can to get you out of it. But I can only give you good will and good advice, and perhaps I might be able to fit answers to your questions better than another. That is all. And now, having such an auxiliary, you must do your best to show the unbelievers that you are right.' "'I ought to try,' I said, since you offer me such invaluable assistance. And I think that, if there is to be a chance of our escaping, we must explain to them whom we mean when we say that philosophers are to rule in the state. Then we shall be able to defend ourselves. There will be discovered to be some natures who ought to study philosophy, and to be leaders in the state, and others who are not born to be philosophers, and are meant to be followers rather than leaders. Then now for a definition, he said. Follow me, I said, and I hope that I may in some way or other be able to give you a satisfactory explanation. Proceed. I dare say that you remember, and therefore I need not remind you, that a lover, if he is worthy of the name, ought to show his love, not to some one part of that which he loves, but to the whole. I really do not understand, and therefore beg of you to assist my memory. Another person, I said, might fairly reply as you do, but a man of pleasure like yourself ought to know that all who are in the flower of youth do somehow or other raise a pang or emotion in a lover's breast, and are thought by him to be worthy of his affectionate regards. Is not this a way which you have with the fair? One has a snub nose, and you praise his charming face. The hook nose of another has, you say, a royal look, while he who is neither snub nor hooked has the grace of regularity. The dark visage is manly, the fair are children of the gods, and as to the sweet honey pale, as they are called, what is the very name but the invention of a lover who talks in diminutives, and is not averse to paleness if appearing on the cheek of youth? In a word, there is no excuse which you will not make, and nothing which you will not say, in order not to lose a single flower that blooms in the springtime of youth. If you make me an authority in matters of love, for the sake of the argument I assent. And what do you say of lovers of wine? Do you not see them doing the same? They are glad of any pretext of drinking any wine. Very good. And the same is true of ambitious men. If they cannot command an army, they are willing to command a file and if they cannot be honoured by really great and important persons, they are glad to be honoured by lesser and mean people, but honour of some kind they must have. Exactly. Once more let me ask, does he who desires any class of goods desire the whole class or a part only? The whole. And may we not say of the philosopher that he is a lover, not of a part of wisdom only, but of the whole? Yes, of the whole. And he who dislikes learning, especially in youth, when he has no power of judging what is good and what is not, such an one we maintain not to be a philosopher or lover of knowledge, just as he who refuses his food is not hungry, and may be said to have a bad appetite, and not a good one? Very true, he said. Whereas he who has a taste for every sort of knowledge, and who is curious to learn, and is never satisfied, may be justly termed a philosopher. Am I not right? Glaucon said, if curiosity makes a philosopher, you will find many a strange being will have a title to the name. All the lovers of sights have a delight in learning, and must therefore be included. Musical amateurs, too, are a folk strangely out of place among philosophers, for they are the last persons in the world who would come to anything like a philosophical discussion, if they could help, while they run about at the Dionysiac festivals as if they had let out their ears to hear every chorus. Whether the performance is in town or country, that makes no difference, there they are. Now are we to maintain that all these, and any who have similar tastes, as well as the professors of quite minor arts, are philosophers? Certainly not, I replied, they are only an imitation. He said, Who then are the true philosophers? Those, I said, who are lovers of the vision of truth. That is also good, he said, but I should like to know what you mean." To another, I replied, I might have a difficulty in explaining, but I am sure that you will admit a proposition which I am about to make. What is the proposition? That since beauty is the opposite of ugliness, they are two. Certainly. And inasmuch as they are two, each of them is one. True again. 
and of just and unjust, good and evil, and of every other class, the same remark holds. Taken singly, each one of them is one, but from the various combinations of them with actions and things, and with one another, they are seen in all sorts of lights, and appear many? Very true. And this is the distinction which I draw between the sight-loving, art-loving, practical class, and those of whom I am speaking, and who are alone worthy of the name of philosophers. How do you distinguish them? he said. The lovers of sounds and sights, I replied, are, as I conceive, fond of fine tones and colours, and forms, and all the artificial products that are made out of them. But their mind is incapable of seeing or loving absolute beauty. True, he replied. Few are they who are able to attain to the sight of this. Very true. And he who, having a sense of beautiful things, has no sense of absolute beauty, or who, if another lead him to a knowledge of that beauty, is unable to follow, of such an one, I ask, is he awake, or in a dream only? Reflect, is not the dreamer, sleeping or waking, one who likens to similar things, who puts the copy in the place of the real object? I should certainly say that such an one was dreaming. But take the case of the other, who recognizes the existence of absolute beauty, and is able to distinguish the idea from the objects which participate in the idea, neither putting the objects in the place of the idea, nor the idea in place of the objects. Is he a dreamer, or is he awake? He is wide awake. And may we not say that the mind of the one who has the knowledge, and that the mind of the other, who opines only, has opinion? Certainly. But suppose that the latter should quarrel with us and dispute our statement, can we administer any soothing cordial or advice to him, without revealing to him that there is sad disorder in his wits? We must certainly offer him some good advice, he replied. Come, then, and let us think of something to say to him. Shall we begin by assuring him that he is welcome to any knowledge which he may have, and that we are rejoiced at his having it? But we should like to ask him a question. Does he who has knowledge know something or nothing? You must answer for him. I answer that he knows something. Something that is or is not. Something that is, for how can that which is not ever be known? And are we assured, after looking at the matter from many points of view, that absolute being is or may be absolutely known, but that the utterly non-existent is utterly unknown? Nothing can be more certain. Good. But if there be anything which is of such a nature as to be and not to be, that will have a place intermediate between pure being and the absolute negation of being? Yes, between them. And, as knowledge corresponded to being and ignorance of necessity to not being, for that intermediate between being and not being, there has to be discovered a corresponding intermediate between ignorance and knowledge, if there be such? Certainly. Do we admit the existence of opinion? Undoubtedly. As being the same with knowledge, or another faculty? Another faculty. Then opinion and knowledge have to do with different kinds of matter corresponding to this difference of faculties? Yes. And knowledge is relative to being and knows being? but before I proceed further I will make a division. What division? I will begin by placing faculties in a class by themselves. They are powers in us, and in all other things, by which we do as we do. Sight and hearing, for example, I should call faculties. Have I clearly explained the class which I mean? Yes, I quite understand. Then let me tell you my view about them. I do not see them, and therefore the distinctions of figure, color, and the like, which enable me to discern the difference of some things, do not apply to them. In speaking of a faculty, I think only of its sphere and its result, and that which has the same sphere and the same result I call the same faculty, but that which has another sphere and another result I call different. Would that be your way of speaking? Yes. And will you be so very good as to answer one more question? Would you say that knowledge is a faculty, or in what class would you place it? Certainly knowledge is a faculty, and the mightiest of all faculties. And is opinion also a faculty? Certainly, he said, for opinion is that with which we are able to form an opinion. And yet you were acknowledging a little while ago that knowledge is not the same as opinion? Why, yes, he said, how can any reasonable being ever identify that which is infallible with that which errs? An excellent answer, proving, I said, that we are quite conscious of a distinction between them. Yes. Then knowledge and opinion, having distinct powers, have also distinct spheres or subject matters? That is certain. Being is the sphere or subject matter of knowledge, and knowledge is to know the nature of being. Yes. And opinion is to have an opinion? 
Yes. And do we know what we opine? Or is the subject matter of opinion the same as the subject matter of knowledge? Nay, he replied, that has been already disproven. If difference in faculty implies difference in the sphere or subject matter, and if, as we are saying, opinion and knowledge are distinct faculties, then the sphere of knowledge and of opinion cannot be the same. Then if being is the subject matter of knowledge, something else must be the subject matter of opinion? Yes, something else. Well, then, is not being the subject matter of opinion? Or, rather, how can there be an opinion at all about not being? Reflect. When a man has an opinion, has he not an opinion about something? Can he have an opinion which is an opinion about nothing? Impossible. He who has an opinion has an opinion about some one thing? Yes. And not being is not one thing, but, properly speaking, nothing? True. Of not being, ignorance was assumed to be the necessary correlative. Of being, knowledge? True, he said. Then opinion is not concerned either with being or with not being? Not with either. And can, therefore, neither be ignorance or knowledge? That seems to be true. But is opinion to be sought without and beyond either of them, in a greater clearness than knowledge, or in a greater darkness than ignorance? In neither. Then I suppose that opinion appears to you to be darker than knowledge, but lighter than ignorance? Both, and in no small degree. And also to be within and between them? Yes. Then you would infer that opinion is intermediate? No question. But were we not saying before, that if anything appeared to be a sort of which is and is not at the same time, that sort of thing would appear also to lie in the interval between pure being and absolute not being, and that the corresponding faculty is neither knowledge nor ignorance, but will be found in the interval between them? True. And in that interval there has now been discovered something which we call opinion? There has. Then what remains to be discovered is the object which partakes equally of the nature of being and not being, and cannot rightly be termed either, pure and simple. This unknown term, when discovered, we may truly call the subject of opinion, and assign each to their proper faculty, the extremes to the faculties of the extremes, and the mean to the faculty of the mean. True. This being premised, I would ask the gentleman who is of opinion that there is no absolute or unchangeable idea of beauty, in whose opinion the beautiful is the manifold, he, I say, your lover of beautiful sights, who cannot bear to be told that the beautiful is one, and the just is one, or that anything is one, to him I would appeal, saying, Will you be so very kind, sir, as to tell us whether, of all these beautiful things, there is one which will not be found ugly, or of the just which will not be found unjust, or of the holy which will not also be unholy? No, he replied, the beautiful will in some point of view be found ugly, and the same is true of the rest. And may not the many, which are doubles, also be halves? Doubles, that is, of one thing, and halves of another? Quite true. And things great and small, heavy and light, as they are termed, will not be denoted by these any more than by the opposite names? True. Both these and the opposite names will always attach to all of them. And can any one of those many things which are called by particular names be said to be this, rather than not to be this? He replied, They are like the punning riddles which are asked at feasts, or the children's puzzle about the eunuch aiming at the bat, with what he hit him, as they say in the puzzle, and upon what the bat was sitting. The individual objects of which I am speaking are also a riddle, and have a double sense, nor can you fix them in your mind, either as being or not being, or both or neither. Then what will you do with them? I said. Can they have a better place than between being and not being? For they are clearly not in greater darkness or negation than not being, or more full of light and existence than being. That is quite true, he said. Thus, then, we seem to have discovered that the many ideas which the multitude entertain about the beautiful, and about all other things, are tossing about in some region which is halfway between pure being and pure not being? We have. Yes, and we had before agreed that anything of this kind which we might find was to be described as matter of opinion, and not as matter of knowledge, being the intermediate flux which is caught and detained by the intermediate faculty. Quite true. Then those who see the many beautiful, and who yet neither see absolute beauty, nor can follow any guide who points the way thither, who see the many just, and not absolute justice, and the like, such persons may be said to have opinion but not knowledge? That is certain. But those who see the absolute, and eternal, and immutable, may be said to know, and not to have opinion only? 
neither can that be denied. The one love and embrace the subjects of knowledge, the other those of opinion. The latter are the same, as I dare say you will remember, who listened to sweet sounds and gazed upon fair colours, but would not tolerate the existence of absolute beauty. Yes, I remember. Shall we then be guilty of any impropriety in calling them lovers of opinion, rather than lovers of wisdom, and will they be very angry with us for thus describing them? I shall tell them not to be angry. No man should be angry at what is true. But those who love the truth in each thing are to be called lovers of wisdom, and not lovers of opinion. Assuredly. End of Book 5《Book Six, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Wadsworth. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Six, Part One. And thus, Locken, after the argument, has gone a weary way. The true and the false philosophers have at length appeared in view. I do not think, he said, that the way could have been shortened. I suppose not, I said, and yet I believe that we might have had a better view of both of them, if the discussion could have been confined to this one subject, and if there were not many other questions awaiting us, which he who desires to see in what respect the life of the just differs from that of the unjust must consider. And what is the next question? he asked. Surely, I said, the one which follows next in order, inasmuch as philosophers only are able to grasp the eternal and unchangeable, and those who wander in the region of the many and variable are not philosophers. I must ask you, which of the two classes should be the rulers of our state? And how can we rightly answer that question? Whichever of the two are best able to guard the laws and institutions of our state, let them be our guardians. Very good. Neither, I said, can there be any question that the guardian who is to keep anything should have eyes rather than no eyes? There can be no question of that. And are not those who are verily and indeed wanting in the knowledge of the true being of each thing, and who have in their souls no clear pattern, and are unable, as with a painter's eye, to look at the absolute truth, and to that original to repair, and having perfect vision of the other world to order the laws about beauty, goodness, justice in this, if not already ordered, and to guard and preserve the order of them, are not such persons, I ask, simply blind? Truly, he replied, they are much in that condition. And shall they be our guardians when there are others who, besides being their equals in experience and falling short of them in no particular of virtue, also know the very truth of each thing? There can be no reason, he said, for rejecting those who have this greatest of all great qualities. They must always have the first place unless they fall in some other respect. Suppose, then, I said, that we determine how far they can unite this and the other excellencies. By all means. In the first place, as we began by observing the nature of the philosopher has to be ascertained, we must come to an understanding about him, and when we have done so, then, if I am not mistaken, we shall also acknowledge that such a union of qualities is possible and that those in whom they are united, and those only, should be rulers in the state. What do you mean? Let us suppose that philosophical minds always love knowledge of a sort which shows them the eternal nature, not varying from generation and corruption. Agreed? And further, I said, let us agree that they are lovers of all true being. There is no part, whether greater or less or more or less honorable, which they are willing to renounce, as we said before of the lover and the man with ambition. True. And if they are to be what we were describing, is there not another quality which they should also possess? What quality? Truthfulness. They will never intentionally receive into their mind falsehood, which is their detestation, 
and they will love the truth. Yes, that may be safely affirmed of them. May be, my friend, I replied. Is not the word, say, rather, must be affirmed? For he whose nature is amorous of anything cannot help loving all that belongs or is akin to the object of his affections. Right, he said. And is there anything more akin to wisdom than truth? How can there be? Can the same nature be a lover of wisdom and a lover of falsehood? Never. The true lover of learning, then, must, from his earliest youth, as far as in him lies, desire all truth? Assuredly. But then again, as we know by experience, he whose desires are strong in one direction will have them weaker than others. They will be like a stream which has been drawn off into another channel. True. He whose desires are drawn towards knowledge in every form will be absorbed in the pleasures of the soul and will hardly feel bodily pleasure. I mean, if he be a true philosopher and not a sham one. That is most certain. Such a one is sure to be temperate and the reverse of covetous, for the motives which make another man desirous of having and spending have no place in his character. Very true. Another criterion of the philosophical nature has also to be considered. What is that? There should be no secret corner of illiberality. Nothing can be more antagonistic than meanness to a soul which is ever longing after the whole of things, both divine and human. Most true, he replied. Then how can he, who has magnificence of mind and is the spectator of all time and all existent, think much of human life? He cannot. Or can such a one account death fearful? No, indeed then the cowardly and mean nature has no part in true philosophy. Certainly not. Or again, can he who is harmoniously constituted, who is not covetous or mean or a boaster or a coward, can he, I say, ever be unjust or hard in his dealings? Impossible. Then you will soon observe whether a man is just and gentle or rude and unsociable, these are the signs which distinguish even in youth the philosophical nature from the unphilosophical. True. There is another point which should be remarked. What point? Whether he has or has not a pleasure in learning, for no one will love that which gives him pain, and in which, after much toil, he makes little progress. Certainly not. And again, if he is forgetful and retains nothing of what he learns, will he not be an empty vessel? That is certain. Laboring in vain, he must end in hating himself and his fruitless occupation. Yes. Then a soul which forgets cannot be ranked among genuine philosophical natures. We must insist that the philosopher should have a good memory. Certainly. And once more, the inharmonious and unseemly nature can only tend to disproportion. Undoubtedly. And do you consider truth to be akin to proportion or to disproportion? To proportion. Then besides other qualities, we must try to find a naturally well-proportioned and gracious mind, which will move spontaneously towards the true being of everything. Certainly. Well, and do not all these qualities which we have been enumerating go together, and are they not, in a manner, necessary to a soul, which is to have a full and perfect participation of being? They are absolutely necessary, he replied. And must not that be a blameless study which he only can pursue who has the gift of a good memory and is quick to learn, noble, gracious, the friend of truth, justice, courage, temperance, who are his kindred. The god of jealousy himself, he said, could find no fault with such a study. And to men like him, I said, when perfected by years and education, and to these only you will entrust the state. Here 
Idiomitis interposed and said, To these statements, Socrates, no one can offer a reply. But when you talk in this way, a strange feeling passes over the minds of your hearers. They fancy that they are led astray a little at each step in the argument, owing to their own want of skill in asking and answering questions. These little accumulate, and at the end of the discussion they are found to have sustained a mighty overthrow, and all their former notions appear to be have turned upside down, and, as unskillful players of draughts are at last shut up by their more skillful adversaries, and have no peace to move, so they too find themselves shut up at last, for they have nothing to say in this new game of which words are counters, and yet all the time they are in the right. The observation is suggested to me by what is now occurring. For any one of us might say that although in words he is not able to meet you, at each step of the argument he seems as a fact that the votaries of philosophy, when they carry on the study, not only in youth as a part of education, but as the pursuit of their mature years, most of them become strange monsters, not to say utter rogues and that those who may be considered the best of them are made useless to the world by the very study which you extol. Well, and do you think that those who say so are wrong? I cannot tell, he replied, but I should like to know what is your opinion. Hear my answer. I am of opinion that they are quite right. Then how can you be justified in saying that cities will not cease from evil until philosophers rule in them, when philosophers are acknowledged by us to be of no use to them. You ask a question, I said, to which a reply can only be given in a parable. Yes, Socrates, and that is a way of speaking, to which you are not at all accustomed, I suppose. I perceive, I said, that you are vastly amused at having plunged me into such a hopeless discussion. But now hear the parable, and then you will be still more amused at the meagerness of my imagination, for the manner in which the best men are treated in their own states is so grievous that no single thing on earth is comparable to it, and therefore, if I am to plead their cause, I must have recourse to fiction, and put together a figure made up of many things like the fabulous unions of goats and stags, which are found in pictures. Imagine, then, a fleet or a ship in which there is a captain who is taller and stronger than any of the crew. But he is a little deaf and has a similar infirmity in sight, and his knowledge of navigation is not much better. The sailors are quarreling with one another about the steering. Everyone is of opinion that he has a right to steer though he has never learned the art of navigation, and cannot tell who taught him or when he learned, and will further assert that it cannot be taught, and they are ready to cut in pieces any one who says the contrary. They throng about the captain, begging and praying him to commit the helm to them, and, if at any time they do not prevail, but others are preferred to them, they kill the others, or throw them overboard, and having first chained up the noble captain's senses with drink or some narcotic drug. They mutiny and take possession of the ship and make free with the stores. Thus, eating and drinking, they proceed on their voyage in such manner as might be expected of them. He who is the partisan and cleverly aids them in their plot for getting the ship out of the captain's hands into their own, whether by force or persuasion, they compliment with the name of sailor, pilot, able seaman, and abuse the other sort of man whom they call a good-for-nothing, but that the true pilot must pay attention to the year and seasons and sky and stars and wind and whatever else belongs to his art if he intends to be really qualified for the command of a ship, and that he must and will be the steerer whether other people like or not. The possibility of this union of authority with the steerer's art has never seriously entered into their thoughts, or been made part of their calling, 
now in vessels which are in a state of mutiny, and by sailors who are mutineers. How will the true pilot be regarded? Will he not be called by them a praetor, a stargazer, a good-for-nothing? Of course, said Idiomatus. Then you will hardly need, I said, to hear the interpretation of the figure which describes the true philosopher in his relation to the state, for you understand it already. Certainly. Then suppose you now take this parable to the gentleman who is surprised at finding that philosophers have no honor in their cities. Explain it to him and try to convince him that their having honor would be far more extraordinary. I will. Say to him that in deeming the best votaries of philosophy to be useless to the rest of the world, he is right. But also tell him to attribute their uselessness to the fault of those who will not use them, and not to themselves. The pilot should not humbly beg the sailors to be commanded by him. This is not the order of nature. Neither are the wise to go to the doors of the rich, and the ingenious author of this saying told a lie. But the truth is that when a man is ill, whether he be rich or poor, to the physician he must go, and he who wants to be governed to him who is able to govern. The ruler who is good for anything ought not to beg his subjects to be ruled by him. Although the present governors of mankind are of a different stamp, they may be justly compared to the mutinous sailors, and the true helmsmen to those who are called by them good-for-nothings and stargazers. Precisely so he said. For these reasons, and among men like these, philosophy, the noblest pursuit of all, is not likely to be much esteemed by those of the opposite faction, not that the greatest and most lasting injuries done to her by her opponents, but by her own professing followers, the same of whom you suppose accuse her to say, that the greatest number of them are errant rogues, and the best are useless, in which opinion I agreed. Yes, and the reason why the good are useless has now been explained. True. End of Book 6, Part 1 Recording by James Wadsworth Book 6, Part 2 of Plato's Republic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Six, Part Two. Then shall we proceed to show that the corruption of the majority is also unavoidable, and that this is not to be laid to the charge of philosophy any more than the other? By all means. And let us ask and answer in turn, first going back to the description of the gentle and noble nature. Truth, as you will remember, was his leader, whom he followed always and in all things. Failing in this, he was an impostor, and had no part or lot in true philosophy. Yes, that was said. Well, and is not this one quality, to mention no others, greatly at variance with present notions of him? Certainly, he said. And have we not a right to say in his defence that the true lover of knowledge is always striving after being, that is his nature? He will not rest in the multiplicity of individuals which is an appearance only, but will go on. The keen edge will not be blunted, nor the force of his desire abate, until he have attained the knowledge of the true nature of every essence, by a sympathetic and kindred power in the soul and by that power drawing near and mingling, and becoming incorporate with very being, having begotten mind and truth, he will have knowledge, and will live and grow truly, and then, and not till then, will he cease from his travail. Nothing, he said, can be more just than such a description of him. And will the love of a lie be any part of a philosopher's nature? Will he not utterly hate a lie? He will. And when truth is the captain, we cannot suspect any evil of the band which he leads. Impossible. 
justice and health of mind will be of the company, and temperance will follow after. True, he replied. Neither is there any reason why I should again set in array the philosopher's virtues, as you will doubtless remember that courage, magnificence, apprehension, memory were his natural gifts, and you objected that, although no one could deny what I then said, still, if you leave words and look at facts, the persons who are thus described are some of them manifestly useless, and the greater number utterly depraved. We were then led to inquire into the grounds of these accusations, and have now arrived at the point of asking why are the majority bad, which question of necessity brought us back to the examination and definition of the true philosopher. Exactly. And we have next to consider the corruptions of the philosophic nature, why so many are spoiled and so few escape spoiling. I am speaking of those who were said to be useless but not wicked and, when we have done with them, we will speak of the imitators of philosophy. What manner of men are they who aspire after a profession which is above them, and of which they are unworthy, and then, by their manifold inconsistencies, bring upon philosophy, and upon all philosophers, that universal reprobation of which we speak? What are these corruptions? he said. I will see if I can explain them to you. Every one will admit that a nature having in perfection all the qualities which we required in a philosopher is a rare plant which is seldom seen among men. Rare indeed. And what numberless and powerful causes tend to destroy these rare natures? What causes? In the first place, there are their own virtues their courage, temperance, and the rest of them, every one of which praiseworthy qualities, and this is a most singular circumstance, destroys and distracts from philosophy the soul which is the possessor of them. That is very singular, he replied. Then there are all the ordinary goods of life, beauty, wealth, strength, rank, and great connections in the state. You understand the sort of things. These also have a corrupting and distracting effect. I understand, but I should like to know more precisely what you mean about them. Grasp the truth as a whole, I said, and in the right way. You will then have no difficulty in apprehending the preceding remarks, and they will no longer appear strange to you. And how am I to do so? he asked. Why, I said, we know that all germs or seeds whether vegetable or animal, when they fail to meet with proper nutriment, or climate, or soil, in proportion to their vigour, are all the more sensitive to the want of a suitable environment, for evil is a greater enemy to what is good than to what is not. Very true. There is reason in supposing that the finest natures, when under alien conditions, receive more injury than the inferior, because the contrast is greater. Certainly. And may we not say, Adamantus, that the most gifted minds, when they are ill-educated, become preeminently bad? Do not great crimes and the spirit of pure evil spring out of a fullness of nature, ruined by education rather than from any inferiority? whereas weak natures are scarcely capable of any very great good or very great evil. There I think that you are right. And our philosopher follows the same analogy. He is like a plant, which, having proper nurture, must necessarily grow and mature into all virtue. But if sown and planted in an alien soil, becomes the most noxious of all weeds, unless he be preserved by some divine power. Do you really think, as people so often say, that our youth are corrupted by sophists, or that private teachers of the art corrupt them in any degree worth speaking of? Are not the public who say these things the greatest of all sophists? And do they not educate to perfection young and old, men and women alike, and fashion them after their own hearts? When is this accomplished? he said. 
when they meet together, and the world sits down at an assembly, or in a court of law, or a theatre, or a camp, or in any other popular resort, and there is great uproar, and they praise some things which are being said or done, and blame other things, equally exaggerating both, shouting and clapping their hands, and the echo of the rocks and the place in which they are assembled redoubles the sound of the praise or blame. At such a time will not a young man's heart, as they say, leap within him? Will any private training enable him to stand firm against the overwhelming flood of popular opinion, or will he be carried away by the stream? Will he not have the notions of good and evil which the public in general have? He will do as they do, and as they are, such will he be. Yes, Socrates, necessity will compel him. And yet, I said, there is a still greater necessity, which has not been mentioned. What is that? The gentle force of attainder, or confiscation, or death which, as you are aware, these new sophists and educators, who are the public, apply when their words are powerless. Indeed they do, and in right good earnest. Now, what opinion of any other sophist, or of any private person, can be expected to overcome in such an unequal contest? None, he replied. No, indeed, I said. Even to make the attempt is a great piece of folly. There neither is, nor has been, nor is ever likely to be, any different type of character, which has had no other training in virtue but that which is supplied by public opinion. I speak, my friend, of human virtue only. What is more than human, as the proverb says, is not included. For I would not have you ignorant that in the present evil state of governments, Whatever is saved and comes to good is saved by the power of God, as we may truly say. I quite assent, he replied. Then let me crave your assent also to a further observation. What are you going to say? Why, that all those mercenary individuals, whom the many call sophists, and whom they deem to be their adversaries, do, in fact, teach nothing but the opinion of the many, that is to say, the opinions of their assemblies, and this is their wisdom. I might compare them to a man who should study the tempers and desires of a mighty strong beast who is fed by him. He would learn how to approach and handle him, also at what times and from what causes he is dangerous or the reverse, and what is the meaning of his several cries and by what sounds, when another utters them, he is soothed or infuriated. And, you may suppose further, that when, by continually attending upon him, he has become perfect in all this, he calls his knowledge wisdom, and makes of it a system or art which he proceeds to teach, although he has no real notion of what he means by the principles or passions of which he is speaking, but calls this honourable and that dishonourable, or good and evil, or just or unjust, all in accordance with the tastes and tempers of the great brute. Good he pronounces to be that in which the beast delights, and evil to be that which he dislikes. And he can give no other account of them except that the just and noble are the necessary having never himself seen, and having no power of explaining to others the nature of either, or the difference between them, which is immense. By heaven, would not such a one be a rare educator? Indeed he would. And in what way does he who thinks that wisdom is the discernment of the tempers and tastes of the motley multitude, whether in painting or music, or finally in politics, differ from him whom I have been describing. For when a man consorts with the many, and exhibits to them his poem, or other work of art, or the service which he has done the state, making them his judges, when he is not obliged, the so-called necessity of Diomede will oblige him to produce whatever they praise. 
and yet the reasons are utterly ludicrous, which they give in confirmation of their own notions about the honourable and good. Did you ever hear any of them which were not? No, nor am I likely to hear. You recognise the truth of what I have been saying. Then let me ask you to consider further whether the world will ever be induced to believe in the existence of absolute beauty, rather than of the many beautiful, or of the absolute in each kind, rather than of the many in each kind? Certainly not. Then the world cannot possibly be a philosopher. Impossible. And therefore philosophers must inevitably fall under the censure of the world. They must. And of individuals who consort with the mob and seek to please them. That is evident. Then do you see any way in which the philosopher can be preserved in his calling to the end? And remember what we were saying of him, that he was to have quickness and memory and courage and magnificence. These were admitted by us to be the true philosopher's gifts. Yes. Will not such an one from his early childhood be in all things first among all, especially if his bodily endowments are like his mental ones? Certainly, he said. And his friends and fellow citizens will want to use him as he gets older for their own purposes. No question. Falling at his feet they will make requests to him and do him honour and flatter him because they want to get into their hands now the power which he will one day possess. That often happens, he said. And what will a man such as he is be likely to do under such circumstances, especially if he be a citizen of a great city, rich and noble, and a tall, proper youth? Will he not be full of boundless aspirations, and fancy himself able to manage the affairs of Hellenes and of barbarians, and having got such notions into his head, will he not dilate and elevate himself in the fullness of vain pomp and senseless pride? To be sure he will. Now, when he is in this state of mind, if someone gently comes to him and tells him that he is a fool and must get understanding, which can only be got by slaving for it, do you think that under such adverse circumstances he will be easily induced to listen? Far otherwise. And even if there be some one who through inherent goodness or natural reasonableness has had his eyes opened a little and is humbled and taken captive by philosophy, how will his friends behave when they think that they are likely to lose the advantage which they were hoping to reap from his companionship? Will they not do and say anything to prevent him from yielding to his better nature, and to render his teacher powerless, using to this end private intrigues as well as public prosecutions? There can be no doubt of it. And how can one who is thus circumstanced ever become a philosopher? Impossible. Then were we not right in saying? that even the very qualities which make a man a philosopher may, if he be ill-educated, divert him from philosophy, no less than riches and their accompaniments and the other so-called goods of life. We were quite right. Thus, my excellent friend, is brought about all that ruin and failure which I have been describing of the natures best adapted to the best of all pursuits. They are natures which we maintain to be rare at any time, this being the class out of which come the men who are the authors of the greatest evil to states and individuals, and also of the greatest good when the tide carries them in that direction. But a small man never was the doer of any great thing, either to individuals or to states. That is most true, he said. And so philosophy is left desolate, with her marriage right incomplete, for her own having fallen away and forsaken her, and while they are leading a false and unbecoming life, other unworthy persons, seeing that she has no kinsmen to be her protectors, enter in and dishonour her, 
and fasten upon her the reproaches which, as you say, her reprovers utter, who affirm of her votaries that some are good for nothing, and that the greater number deserve the severest punishment. That is certainly what people say. Yes, and what else would you expect, I said, when you think of the puny creatures who, seeing this land open to them, a land well stocked with fair names and showy titles, like prisoners running out of prison into a sanctuary, take a leap out of their trades into philosophy, those who do so being probably the cleverest hands at their own miserable crafts. For although philosophy be in this evil case, still there remains a dignity about her which is not to be found in the arts, and many are thus attracted by her whose natures are imperfect and whose souls are maimed and disfigured by their meannesses as their bodies are by their trades and crafts is not this unavoidable yes are they not exactly like a bald little tinker who has just got out of durance and come into a fortune he takes a bath and puts on a new coat and is decked out as a bridegroom going to marry his master's daughter who is left poor and desolate. A most exact parallel. What will be the issue of such marriages? Will they not be vile and bastard? There can be no question of it. And when persons who are unworthy of education approach philosophy and make an alliance with her who is a rank above them, what sorts of ideas and opinions are likely to be generated? Will they not be sophisms, captivating to the ear, having nothing in them genuine, or worthy of, or akin to true wisdom? No doubt, he said. Then, Adamantus, I said, the worthy disciples of philosophy will be but a small remnant. Perchance some noble and well-educated person, detained by exile in her service, who, in the absence of corrupting influences, remains devoted to her, or some lofty soul born in a mean city, the politics of which he contemns and neglects, and there may be a gifted few who leave the arts which they justly despise and come to her, or peradventure there are some who are restrained by our friend Theages' bridle, for everything in the life of Theages conspired to divert him from philosophy but ill health kept him away from politics. My own case of the internal sign is hardly worth mentioning, for rarely, if ever, has such a monitor been given to any other man. Those who belong to this small class have tasted how sweet and blessed a possession philosophy is, and have also seen enough of the madness of the multitude, and they know that no politician is honest, nor is there any champion of justice at whose side they may fight and be saved. Such a one may be compared to a man who has fallen among wild beasts. He will not join in the wickedness of his fellows, but neither is he able singly to resist all their fierce natures, and therefore seeing that he would be of no use to the state or to his friends, and reflecting that he would have to throw away his life without doing any good either to himself or others, he holds his peace and goes his own way. He is like one who, in the storm of dust and sleet which the driving wind hurries along, retires under the shelter of a wall, and seeing the rest of mankind full of wickedness, he is content if only he can live his own life and be pure from evil or unrighteousness, and depart in peace and good will with bright hopes. Yes, he said, and he will have done a great work before he departs. A great work, yes, but not the greatest, unless he finds a state suitable to him. For in a state which is suitable to him, he will have a larger growth, and be the saviour of his country as well as of himself. The causes why philosophy is in such an evil name have now been sufficiently explained. The injustice of the charges against her has been shown. Is there anything more which you wish to say? Nothing more on that subject, he replied. 
End of Book 6, Part 2